and Brandon. Live from Chatterbox Sports Studios, it's Off the Bench with Tom Brenneman. Well, good morning, good morning, and a pleasant good Wednesday morning. Each and every one of you, we welcome you to Off the Bench, presented by United Dairy Farmers. We come your way Monday through Friday, 10 A to 12. P. And you can join us on YouTube slash Chatterbox Sports. If you prefer to join us in podcast form, we continue to grow 20% every month in our podcast. Just uh, search off the bench with Tom Brenneman and you're dialed in. Kind enough to join us from the Great American Ballpark, one of my all-time favorite guys in baseball, and, and he knows I mean that sincerely, is the manager of the Colorado Rockies. He's been at it a long time, managerial stints in San Diego, and now with the Rockies, Bud Black. Bud, uh, good morning. I was sitting there saying to myself, man, it's been a long time since I've had a chance to see you and say hello. Outside of not winning games right now, how you doing otherwise? Tom, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, overall I'm doing well. Uh, it's great to hear your voice. Uh, like you said, we go way back. And when I was watching the intro, uh, you know, to the, uh, to the show, uh, I couldn't help but smile when I saw a young Tom Brenneman, hmm. uh, seeing your dad, uh, you know, it's just it's such good stuff. It brings back a lot of memory. So anyway, uh, it's great to be on. I'm doing well. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, present day, we're in a, a little bit of a, a funk here uh, with uh, with our club. But on balance, uh, outside of, uh, you know, the baseball world, everything's fine. Thank I'm you. I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, let, let me ask you a little bit about, though, Bud, when, when you go through tough times as a manager, I, I, I'm often fascinated, and I've never really been close enough to it. The closest I ever came was our old friend Bob Brenly, uh, my former broadcast partner, when he was managing in Arizona. So I got to learn a little bit more of kind of the inside. But when you're, when you're managing a team, it's scuffling. What, what, what do you try to do? Are, are you spending more time with players individually? Are you a fan of team meetings? You know, where do you find the patience to get through it? Well, I, you know, I think every situation's different. I think with, with ours, uh, I think we have to really keep things in perspective uh, uh, of what's really going on, you know, with our club. Uh, you know, we're banged up, right? We have, uh, you know, four, five players uh, who are key members of our team, not active. Charlie Blackman, uh, Chris Bryant, uh, CJ Crone, uh, Brendan Rogers, uh, Sean Bouchard. I mean, guys that we, you know, penciled in to be a big part of our group. Uh, our pitching staff, uh, Herman Marquez, Antonio Sensatella, Ryan Feltner uh, are all on the disabled list. So, I think you look at you look at the group and you you realize, you know what's going on in present time and uh, the perspective I think is important. Uh, you know the everyday uh, the everyday grind that we go through. It's hard when you you know, end up on the on the losing side of, of ball games and, and that's it's been a tough road trip for us. But uh, it comes down to meeting with players, I think more individually. And there's a lot of teaching going on because we have a lot of young players. So the, uh, you know, the teacher aspect comes out of a, uh, of a coach, comes out of me, comes out of our coaches. Uh, a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with players. There's some, in, there's some group meetings a little bit, maybe not so much a team meeting, Tom, because I think the players are, are aware of what's going on. So uh, as long as you know the the process is right during the course of the day, the the pregame prep is good. The the effort level, uh, how we're playing, uh, you know that that all comes into play on what you see. And if things are in order, uh, you know you can you can live with it. 
Uh, last night being an exception, we had a tough day on the on the mound with one of our pitchers who made three errors in one inning that cost us some runs. And he's, uh, astonishingly, he's one of our better fielding pitchers and one of our better athletes on the club. But uh, that happens. But you know, overall, I think there's a there's a pulse that you that you read of how the team's doing, uh, in their uh, in 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 their uh, in a way their their mojo. And if it's still good, uh, you let them play and you let them learn, especially all of our young players. You know, it's interesting how sometimes you can learn a lot about players that you didn't figure would be a part of your team when you have injuries like you guys have. Mm -hmm. You know, the Reds uh, try to take a look at a lot of young players last year. And, and then by the end of the year, you're able to answer some questions about what kind of player you think each of these guys is going to be. Is that a situation that you're in now where you're saying, OK, you know, in all fairness, a guy probably should have spent the year at AAA or he should have been a spot starter yeah. here and there. But now we're going to learn in a hurry what this guy might be all about and whether or not he's a part of our future or not. Yeah, I mean, great point. Uh, and you've uh, you hit it on the you hit it on the you hit it on the hail you hit it you hit the nail on the head for sure uh, with what the Reds went through uh, the last couple of years and especially last year and and you're seeing the results of that now with a lot of these younger players. Uh, you know, we're going through the same thing uh, right now. Uh, you know, Nolan Jones. Uh, Montero, uh, Montes, uh, Tovar, who's our shortstop, who just actually gave birth to uh, his wife, gave birth to their first child. Uh, you know, while we're here in Cincinnati, he, uh, uh, his wife gave birth uh, birth back in Denver. Uh, you know, he looks to be a guy. Uh, Noah Davis, Connor Siebold, uh pitchers. Uh, you know, who are, are young, who are not tenured, who are getting opportunities, some guys in our bullpen as well. So, uh, you know, this affords us an opportunity to look at these fellas, albeit, you know, for circumstances based on injury. But nevertheless, uh, in the long in the long run, it helps it helps a club. And uh, I think the Reds are a, an example of that uh, in what they've done the last couple of years. And it's, uh, you know, showing up with uh, you know, both on the mound and on the on the field with their group of players. You just saw the Reds bugged uh, a few weeks back out at your place in Denver, and ever since then, now they've started to bring up a lot of these young players. And obviously, things are are going very, very well for them right now. <clears throat> when you look at their team, uh, and, and look, they're in a very different division than you're in. And I'm not suggesting they couldn't compete with the Dodgers. They just beat them two out of three here about two weeks ago. Uh, or compete with the Padres, who are under 500 and spending a gazillion dollars, uh, on and on and on and on. Um, when you look at the Reds, do, do you see – yes, you're saying a team has got a 10-game win streak. But do you look at this team and say, man, uh, that, that looks like it's a contending team, or you use a word a minute ago because they walk around and say they got really good mojo right now. What, what are your thoughts on them? Yeah, well, uh, you're right. Uh, you know, a lot can be – said about the the mojo of a team when they're going well uh, but if you were to break down the reds i think on the position player side uh, you know it, it looks right it really does uh, you know if Votto, uh now it's, <clears throat> it's only been a couple of days but you know joey in, in in two games looks pretty good and there's a veteran hitter right in the middle of that lineup to go with the young kid de la cruz uh Steer, McLean, I think Indy is a, a, a nice player. Uh, they got some veteran catchers that I like. The outfield's uh, mobile. Uh, you know, those guys have a little uh, energy. The, the, you know, Fraley and Friedel and Senzel. They got some, uh, what I got, they, and you've seen David do this a little bit. Now there's a there's some, you know, pinch hitting. There's They're doing some things to get platoon matchups, but uh, the talent on the position player side looks pretty good, Tom. It, it looks, uh, you know, like a, a team every night can match up with the other side. Uh, and I know they're banged up on the mound. That, you know, that's, uh, you know, I'm sure a concern for the Reds. Uh, you know, I saw the big left-handed pitcher last year. Uh, uh, Lodolo. Lodolo. Yeah. yeah Lodolo. Uh, and Hunter Green, uh, you know, those are two really nice arms. Uh, so the, uh, I'm sure they're going to seek some starting pitching help here. There's some big arms in the pen, uh, you know, maybe not, uh, you know, household names, but there's some stuff out there. The closer, 
you know, has a good arm and it seems to have, you know, worked his way through, uh, you know, safe situations, but it's stuff. I mean, they, they got stuff and, uh, and that, and that, and that plays, but on balance, it looks, uh, you know, that it could be sustainable. I think the, you know, on the pitching side, it's, you know, like I said, I'm sure they're, you know, trying to get some reinforcements because the few guys that are banged up, but, uh, you know, it's it's come pretty quickly for them, and we've seen them when we're hot. Now the time time will come when you know maybe you know they're you know things aren't going their way, and it'll be a, they'll be tested. But uh, you know, it looks right. You know, but in my thirty plus years uh, as a broadcaster, and many of those years were spent inside your division in the National League West, out with Arizona. I always found it so fascinating to have. And I had the chance to have lengthy conversations with some of your predecessors out there in Denver, whether it was Jim Leland or Don Baylor or Clint Hurdle, uh, among others, uh, Walt Weiss to a, a lesser extent. These are guys that know a lot about baseball. I mean, a lot about baseball, like you do. Uh, you, you had a great career as a pitcher. You started as a pitching coach right out of the gate in Cleveland. Then on you go to becoming a manager. And I always used to be fascinated at how they would talk about how difficult it is to manage in Denver. You've been there now, what, since 2017. Is it unique, very unique compared to managing in, say, where you were in San Diego? Yeah, it's, it, it, it's unique. Tom, I think that, uh, you know, because of uh, being a mile uh, above sea level, uh, the light air, the altitude, you know, a number of things come into play. Uh, you know, first off, the game is, is, a little, is, is a little different, right? And with our ballpark, and you've been there, uh, it's, a, it's a spacious park. Uh, there's runs there. Uh, the way the ball behaves there, both out of the pitcher's hand and uh, and the flight of the ball, uh, it's unique. So, uh, you know, the adjustment that the that players have to make, that uh, managers, pitching coaches have to make to to work your way through a game or a three or four game series, it's different than other places. Uh, but that's you know that's the Rockies' reality, and I think uh, for the most part, and what you know I've tried to do, and my predecessors have tried to use that to our advantage, uh, you know, especially on the mound, because I know coming in as a visiting team, visiting player, uh, it's uncomfortable uh, for an opposing pitching staff. Uh, conversely, it's uh, <clears throat> it's sort of confidence for a, a, a visiting team's offense. Uh, and then on top of that, I think the, you know, the physical uh, nature uh, that altitude takes on the body, uh, you have to be aware of that as well uh, when you're <clears throat> going through the six-month season and, you know, three months in, in altitude. Uh, but I got to give credit to the Rockies uh, training staff, their medical department, their strength and conditioning staff about how to keep players uh, healthy, how to keep players uh, you know, physically able to, you know, to play at their, at their highest level uh, coming in and out of altitude. So it's unique. Uh, you know, the Rockies have known this and they're, and they're getting better at the studies over the, over the 30 year period, but on a, on an every game level, it's different how you have to, uh, you know, manage your pitching staff, your starter, uh, as you know, you've seen many times if you go to the pen too early in a series, mm -hmm. if you uh, have to use multiple relievers, I mean, all those things come into play. Uh, and if it's a if it's a, a ten game homestand in Denver, I mean, those are those are killers a lot of times in a, in a number of ways. But it's a unique environment, uh, and I know that. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's hard. It's just unique. And I think that, uh, you know, the Rockies have, you know, shown, you know, resiliency over the years in a, in a lot of different factors. And there's been some, you know, some, you know, there's a World Series year in 07. Uh, you know, we went to the playoffs, uh, you know, 17 and 18. Uh, you know, the Rockies, you know, there's been, they've been some playoff-bound teams. But, again, I think that 
in any situation, Tom, as you know, it's about the it's about the players and getting the right players. And I know that uh, you know one of our biggest criteria is uh, you know getting the right players who can handle the physical nature of, of Denver and on the pitching side, the mental toughness that our pitchers have to have to be able to withstand the rigors of uh, giving up runs of uh, an unsightly ERA, uh, you know, balls dropping, uh, you know, in outfield spots that would otherwise be caught in, in smaller ballparks. I mean, all those things add up to, uh, you know, getting the right players who can handle the conditions. Uh, last thing I want to ask you about and let you go, and we thank you for your time. How have you felt about the uh, the rule changes in baseball this year? Some say it's dramatically affected pitchers far more than hitters. What do you think? Well, I, I mean, on balance, I like them all. Uh, I really do. I think it uh, I think it's helped the game, especially uh, you know from the fan perspective, how the game's moving. Uh, you know, the, the the pitch clock I think has has been uh, a bonanza. I know that uh, there's talk that uh, it has affected pitchers uh, on the health side. I'm I'm not I'm not so sure about that, Tom. Uh, I think we got to do a little bit more homework on that. But on balance, I think the game is has moved quicker, and I think that's a, a huge benefit to to the game. And I think there's overall been better play, uh, especially on on defense and keeping guys on their toes, and uh, just the pace is uh, good, and getting guys in the batter's box and getting guys on the rubber to. Uh, to engage in that confrontation. I think the, the shift rules has been, uh, I think I like that as well. Uh, the uh, the uh, two throwovers, to the, engage, the disengagements, uh, throwovers to first, I think that's been good too. I really do. It's, it's put an emphasis on, uh, on the pitching side to, to you know, be able to handle the, uh, the running game a little bit better with your times to the plate. Uh, I think teams are utilizing that from a speed component uh, with how they construct their rosters. And I think we'll see more of that moving forward. Um, You know, I think it's all been, I think it's all been uh, well thought out for the last four or five years. The people in New York have done a great job of, 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 of really putting it in play in, uh, in the minor leagues and some of the independent leagues. And I think it's worked out for the best. I really do. Uh, and we'll see going forward if uh, if it continues to show improvement in the game. But I've been I've been pleased. I was uh, a little skeptical at first, but uh, I'm a believer now. And you know, Tom, I think the next thing coming is is probably that uh, you know the automated strike zone yeah. uh, to some uh, to some uh, uh, some consent. But I can't thank you enough for the time. I know you got a game in a couple of hours. It's great to see you, man. The best to you and your bride and your two daughters. And, uh, and, and thanks so much again for your time today. We really appreciate it. Tom, always a pleasure. Uh, you know, you're one, of the, uh, you're one of the good guys in this game. Uh, and I've always thought that uh, uh, you get it. And to say that uh, uh, a guy gets it, you know, that means a lot to me. So uh, all the best to you moving forward, Tom. Thank you, bud. Bud Black, kind enough to join us from Great American Ballpark, manager of the Colorado Rockies. I, I remember meeting him for the very first time. I've never forgotten this moment in my life. He was uh, pitching for the Giants, and uh, I'm in an elevator down at the ballpark, and him and Dwayne Kuyper and the guy who turned out to be my partner later on, Bob Brindley, and Mike Kruko all get on the elevator, and I'm on the elevator at Riverfront Stadium. And these guys start in on me. I don't know if they knew who I was or somebody told them in the elevator. I can't remember. But I mean, they start in on me and and just hammer city right from the start. What I'm wearing, my hair too long. I don't even know these guys. And uh, and then it turns out years and years later, uh, Bob Brenly is my broadcast partner. Bud Black is... um, he is a, um, I'm trying to remember where he wound up at that point in time. Once he, 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 well, he, had, he, he retired playing, became a pitching coach up in Cleveland. And, um, and, and then, you know, Dwayne Kuyper and Mike Kruko, they're still the broadcasters for the San Francisco Giants even today. And um, we got to get Kruko and Kuyper on here together sometime. Many people feel like they are the best broadcast team by far in Major League Baseball with the Giants. And they got John Miller out there. And, I mean, it's a, it's a, a big league operation. Speaking of big league operations, the train just keeps on rolling. 
for the Redlegs, right? Last night, they opened a big lead over Colorado. They hang on to win. Rockies had them loaded in the bottom of the ninth, 8-6 a final. Their 10th win in a row. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. It's a club's longest winning streak since 2012. That's right, longest winning streak. Longest winning streak. That was a year you may remember my dad. He lost a bet to Chris Spire, who was a coach for the Reds at the time. My dad had said the Reds have zero chance to win 10 games in a row. Ironically, they were in Colorado when they won their 10th game in a row that year. And my dad lost a bet, said he had to shave his head. Wound up raising hundreds of thousands of dollars for the Dragonfly Foundation. Well, last night, Will Benson hit a home run. Ailey De La Cruz had three hits and a home run. Uh, but really, it is their aggressive base running. This is starting to become the staple in many ways of this team, which led to a pair of runs in the fifth. You heard Bud Black talk about it a minute ago. It forced Colorado's pitcher into three throwing errors, two of them on pickoff attempts. Now, starting pitching continues to be a major issue for this team. It's not hurting them now because they're overcoming poor starting pitching. Ben Lively lasted only four innings last night. But my question is this and has continued to be, what is the long-term toll on this bullpen? Because I'm starting to wonder, now you tell me, and look, I'm not trying to throw water on the fire here. I'm not, okay? But, but we like laying out all the facts here on Off the Bench, okay? This isn't a cheerleading show, all right? I'm starting to wonder about the bullpen. Are we starting to see cracks for the first time from them being overworked? I mean, they got to cover five innings again last night. As great as Diaz has been, and he should be in the All-Star game, I think it's safe to say he's been the best closer in the National League so far this year. But, but, last couple of times out, he's not been so good. He got out of the jam last night. After they gave up three in the eighth, he gives up another in the ninth, has to get out of the bases loaded jam. I'm a little concerned, okay? I am a little concerned. You may not be, I am be, I am. Reds remain a half game ahead of Milwaukee in the National League Central, and I tell you who's red hot, but being overshadowed by white hot Cincinnati is Chicago, the Cubbies. Cubs have won seven in a row and 11 of their last 14. They shut out the Pirates last night, and they are now in third place, only three and a half games behind Cincinnati. More on the Reds here in a second. College baseball, we're down to the final four in the College World Series. And everybody's rooting for TCU, right? America's team? America's team. America's team. They took down Oral Roberts yesterday and will face... The second-ranked Florida Gators. So they restart, Paul. You explained to me the other day. Now you reload. Everybody's undefeated, right? You're in a double elimination from what I read. You're in a double elimination now in the semifinals. Am I right on that or wrong on yeah, that? Yeah, I have to I have to go check. I'll be honest. The last, like, two or three days, I haven't been able to really watch any of the College World Series. I missed the LSU-Wake Forest game, which I was – very bummed about, but that was the Reds. I was down at the Reds. I really haven't seen anything in the last two days, so I don't know where they are in the bracket. When they get to the final, when they get to the final two teams, that's when it gets to a two out of three. Um, I haven't seen where they are right now, though, so okay. I can go check. I thought check I read that sure. yesterday. I thought I read that yesterday. I could okay. be wrong. But anyway, you have um, TCU against Florida today at two. Number one Wake Forest will face LSU after the Tigers Shut out Tennessee 5 nothing last night. FC Cincinnati. Casey, you're thinking about going. You got ducats tonight. Yes, I do. I got some tickets, and uh, we bought these a while ago, like a month ago, but um, it's going to be a little difficult with the, uh, the injury, so we'll, we'll see. Okay. Well, we hope Alex is okay. Yep. Get over there and watch uh, FC Cincinnati putting its league leading best record on the line tonight in MLS play. Toronto comes to TQL Stadium. Toronto is 3-5-10. and 10. 10 would be ties on the year. FC Cincinnati is undefeated 
at home so far this season. Uh, Tom, they have just to clarify here. Uh, they do. They're, it's it doesn't reset yet. It's still a double elimination. So basically, this is if you follow college baseball, this is like the regional final of the uh, of the College World Series. So the two four team brackets are playing right now. So if the teams that haven't lost yet don't lose. If they would, the so team- Florida has not lost. Let's just use it in TCU because everybody else has lost a game. Yes. Wake has lost a game. TCU has lost a game. LSU has lost a game. Yes. Right. So, so if the winner of the, the the winner of the Wake Forest LSU game moves on to the title round, period. Yep. Right. Because I think each of those teams has lost a game. I'm sure they have. Yeah, so Florida plays TCU, Wake Forest, Wake Forest plays yeah. LSU. Those are both tonight. If TCU they, wins, they have to play Florida again. Yes. Because an, Florida has not lost. And an if necessary game tomorrow. There's also an if necessary Wake Forest and LSU game tomorrow. Uh, okay, so Wake hasn't lost Wake yet. has not lost Okay, yet. all right, okay. So those, right. Those, those are the two games there. So if those two teams were to win, if Florida and Wake were to win – they would play each other in a two out of three in the final, which would start on June 24th. Okay. So there you go. All right. So there we go. But we're rooting for um, the Horn Frogs. I brought up earlier, the only, the only university in America, the only one. <coughs> Sorry, bless, bless you. God bless you. Bless College you. football I final it. four playoff, right? Went to the championship game. NCAA men's basketball tournament. They were in that bad boy. Won a game, and now they're in the Final Four of the College World Series in baseball. Big league operation. Nick Lodolo, undoubtedly, will be sitting in front of the television uh, watching that one today, his Horned Frogs. Um, Okay, let's start with the Red Legs, because that's the talk of the town right now. Um, Votto goes hitless last night. I failed to mention that. Goes 0 for 4, but it doesn't matter. They win. Uh, and Votto's all about winning. Uh, De La Cruz has been scuffling here lately. Three hits last night, including a home run. In fairness, that home run, the only ballpark in America that's a home run would have been a great American ballpark, but it's a home run nonetheless. So you got to feel good about that. Friedel continues to play really, really well. I looked up yesterday. Friedel, you know, everybody's talking about moving ahead and what's going to happen down the road here. Friedel last night, I believe only played his 137th major league game. So he's not even played a full season yet. You know, of all the guys we talk about, McLean and De La Cruz and Steer and all these guys, rightfully so. I got to tell you, it's starting to look to me more and more like as Friedel goes, that's how that Reds offense goes. He's leading off today. I like his game. I like his game a lot. Of all the outfielders they have on this team, he's a guy for me, money in the bank, on this club next year starting every day. Elliot, your thoughts on that? 100%. 100%. He's the most talented outfielder we have right now. Will Benson's starting to, starting to come up on him, but I think T.J. Friedel, he offers more versatility than any player. He can lay down a bunt at any second. He can hit a home run at any second. He's a great, he's a great defender, great outfielder. I love T.J. Friedel. Absolutely love him. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Ellie just said it perfectly. I mean, he's hitting 322 on the year. What more do you want out of a leadoff hitter? All he does is get on base. So no, there's like no doubt. Time, I mean, every time he comes up to the plate. Yeah, Nick jumps in, Nick Kirby, and he says, uh, without a doubt, the most underrated player on the team. I, I agree 1,000%. The Reds finally have a guy they can count on being a leadoff batter, getting on base, and starting to make things happen. So, they go for 11 straight today. And look, the way this rotation sets up right now, there is no one. No one, even if Hunter Green was healthy, there is no one you'd rather have taking that ball today. The guy's not giving up a run. Andrew Abbott. Yep. Does that continue today, yay or nay, men? Does he get through his start today at home against the Batlin Rockies with still a 0.00 earn run average? Yay or nay? I'm going to say the Reds win. I'm going to say that he does give up a run. This just feels like a game where he shouldn't give up a run, so that means you probably do. Isn't that how it always goes in sports against a team like the Rockies? That I'll be honest. You know, We were talking last night about the Rockies and, and how this team looked. And you know, A lot of times when 
the the Reds and are, are are playing well. You're trying to assess the the value of the competition and see what it means and how the Reds are playing and and who they're beating. And yes, you got to beat the teams in front of you, but at the same time, you know the Rockies. The Rockies right now do not look like a, a very good ball club, no. as Reed likes to say. No. Uh, they do not look like a very good ball club at all. <laughs> kind of hapless, making unforced errors. And so on the back end of that, I don't know. This just seems like – I'm not saying that he's going to blow up. I still think that he hasn't shown any reason why he wouldn't. But right. the Rockies scratch across one run in a park like this, maybe run into a fastball or something. I'd say they get one or two. I think Abbott. I think Abbott does it again. I think he. I think he's going to go six innings, zero runs again. Wow. Yeah, six innings, zero runs. I bet he gives up only like three hits today. I, there's not a lot in that Rockies lineup either. That I mean, their pitching's horrible. Their lineup's not that good either. I mean, McMahon, Diaz, Mustakis is I think is like their fourth best hitter right now due to the injuries. So I don't know. I the, the Rockies stink. <laughs> I do want it on the record that I did take Abbott at six plus strikeouts. That's already locked in. Okay, so I have full faith. Oh, Fred Sport. I have full faith in our he, guy Andrew Abbott. He's to yet come to do through. that, by the way. I yeah. don't believe he's gotten higher than five, right? Yeah. Well. All right. First so time you're for everything. He has to get six or more than six. I think I. I think I had six. I got to okay, check. Okay. Uh, if you six. bet more than six, I think that's a bad bet. I think I took six. Sometimes you have to just chase the value, Tom. Yeah, Chase because the value, what the hell does that mean? If All I want to know <laughs> is, is, is Andrew Abbott going to strike out six guys? What does that mean, Chase the value? Help if, me here. Help me a little if, bit. If, you know, Andrew Abbott might not get seven strikeouts, but if, if that's, you know, plus 500 or something like that, they're just begging you to take it. Good value. It's what bad gamblers do to justify Correct. fun bets in their heads. Correct. You snipe value. Snipe. I like that word. Yeah. Yes. Snipe. It's like Night Elliot value. giving out a team down five in the first inning. That's right. Yeah. That, Tom. Elliot had the most incredible bet of all time. So he does a segment every day, post-produced. Yes, I'm well aware. The, the Z Brazilianaires. Yep. Well, the other day he recorded the segment, and he didn't realize that one of his picks, the Cardinals, was a day game. So by the time he published the video, they were already losing 5 nothing. Well, when he published the video, they were losing 5 nothing. That was the worst that they played the whole game. They came back and won. So if you took Elliot's pick – Right when we published the video, we gave you the best value of a parlay I'm just trying the to entire win the, day. I'm just trying to win the people money. That's all yeah. I'm trying to do. How, how are you doing, by the way? I'm 2-0 and this week, Tom. I, so I won Monday's parlay, miracle parlay with the Cardinals, down 5-0. Yes, or, and then yesterday, the Reds, I rode the Reds again. They won, and I had the under in the Braves Phillies. So I'm 2-0 and this week. I think that's like plus 200 each parlay. So how about that? Drew Garrison in the chat says Elliot has an insider in Vegas. I can't confirm, can't conf, can't confirm nor deny. Yeah, you see, if you're going to use that line, you can't stumble on it. Red. That <laughs> is a critical line, right? It's all in the delivery. I cannot confirm nor deny. Yeah, that was right? a mess up. That all was right. a mess up. That's all right. We all do. Red, Reds minus one and a half. Ellie to get a hit. Andrew Abbott, six plus strikeouts. An alternate uh, over eight and a half runs total in the game, twenty five bucks to pay out one hundred and fifty. That's called value. Value. That's plus five hundred right there. Whew. Value. Coming for you, Fred. All right, <laughs> all right, Ham and Eggers, uh, take it away here. Uh, look, coming up on the show today, and we're gonna, you know, we got about another half hour to talk about the Reds. Coming up on the show today, um, I, I look. Um, this is a guy named Sid Ziegler, and, and we will tell you more about who he is and what he does and all those kinds of things coming up a little bit later on. Um, but as some of you, many of you, most of you know, I lost my job with the Reds three years ago for an off-air homophobic slur. Uh, ever since then, uh, I have had a chance to meet, talk, listen, most of all, and try to learn what that word that I used really means rather than just some locker room slang term that uh, you heard all the time back in the 80s and 90s. Um, this guy wrote a column the day after I was fired, actually the day after I said what I said, and you knew the firing was coming. Um, I've never met him, had never been around him. Uh, I was sent the column that he wrote on his website, which he founded, called Outsports.com. And basically... It was saying that, look, uh, for multiple reasons, and I'll let him explain rather than me, but the bottom line is, uh, and just like the Bob Huggins situation a couple weeks ago, when everything happened with Bob Huggins, 
I told Bob Huggins he needs to meet Sid Ziegler because uh, the ways in which Sid Ziegler helped me try to learn and to grow and people I could meet to learn and to grow and to listen to, right, uh, changed my life. And so I'm forever indebted to this. I've never met him in person. I've talked to him on the phone numerous times. Um, today, when we have him on a, uh, a, a video link up, it'll actually be the first time I've ever seen him, even though he's been on countless times, CNN and MSNBC and Fox News, and, and he's written for the New York Times. He's written for Sports Illustrated. But we're going to talk about this is Pride Month in the United States of America. Um, and we're going to talk about a lot of topics in the intersection today between LGBTQ and that community and athletics. And there's a lot going on, okay? There's a lot going on, whether it's some of the, the hockey players this year that said they weren't going to wear the pride colors, whether it's Major League Baseball teams and having pride night and all the protests that took place out in Los Angeles. We're going to talk about transgender athletes today. But we're also going to talk about um, how there has been incredible growth among universities, coaches, administrators, high school coaches, high school administrators in, you know, really trying to become more inclusive and understanding of kids who are gay and they're also athletes. So we're going to have a lengthy discussion with Sid Ziegler coming up at 11 o'clock. Uh, we thank Bud Black for his time and Ham and Eggers. We now give it off to you, Mr. President. Please take it away. <laughs> it's that time of the show, the Ham and Eggers. These guys are great. Trust me, I would know. I introduce all the best segments. All right, well, we talked about, uh, let's see here. Um, let's go with the Bengals report. I'm sure at some point here, Bengals probably get brought up, whether it's here in, in the chat. Bengals report is brought to you by Encore Technologies. Encore Technologies provides IT solutions with a, for a data-centered world with a suite of services from mobile computing to desktop to data center, supporting both centralized and work-from-home computing models to improve efficiency and productivity. That's right, Casey. Visit Encore.tech. The path to innovation begins here. There is also a new premium alkaline water out. It's Pawnee. And it tastes fantastic. It's right here. You can see it. Blue bottle. And we have a lot of new people in the chat, a lot of people that have joined the show here in the last couple of weeks. So if you don't know about Pawnee, it's new. It is a water that uses natural limestone filtration, unlike the artificial processing that a lot of the other bigger brands use. Uh, but Pawnee water right now, as they build and as they grow, you can see their ingredients list. It's just water. There's no artificial processing, nothing else. We're here to boost them up. And if you're down the road at the River's Edge Concert Series this summer, it's their official water. You can get it if you're around here in Hamilton, gas stations around the tri-state area, wherever you might be. You can visit their website at pawneywater.com. That is P-A-H-H-N-I water.com. P-A-H-H-N-I water.com to see where you can buy it. Drink Pawnee Water, get your coffee from UDF, bet with Betfred, and get your technology solutions from Encore.tech. A couple of programming notes. Make sure you like the stream. We're at 42 likes right now. We have over 240 people watching the stream right now. So make sure you go in and like the stream, subscribe to the channel. If you're listening to Chatterbox Reds, go in, download Leave a rating and a review on all the podcast platform for Chatterbox Reds, for the stream, for whatever it might be, whether it's YouTube, whatever. Go in there, like the stream, leave a podcast rating, review, download it, all that good stuff. Chatterbox Reds is the 11th best baseball podcast in the country right now on Apple, and they are very, very close to breaking into the top 200 of all sports podcasts. Uh, would not be surprised if they did that this week. Uh, they're right on the doorstep of that. And the other thing, July 17th, I'll keep promoting this. July 17th, you'll find out more details in the coming days. July 17th, mark your calendar. It is Reds Night, Chatterbox Night, Reds Night, 
down there at Great American Ballpark. They're playing the San Francisco Giants. So you can go down there. We have the party deck out in center field rented out. The uh, boat deck out there, Trace rented it out. Hoping to get a lot of you come and, and watch the game with us and, and enjoy some good company. So uh, July 17th. Anything else that I'm – oh, box lunch today. I'm hosting box I'm, – what I'm really doing – I'm not hosting box lunch today. I'm moderating box lunch today because Jacob and Casey – I can't believe I'm about to say this <laughs> – are about to argue whether Geno Smith is a top 10 quarterback. And Casey has been burning the midnight oil for a monologue that he will deliver to all of you, and then they'll go back and forth. So we're going to keep it concise because the Reds play at 1235. So our show will end by 1235. But I'll be up there. We'll we'll moderate it, and, and we'll get going. Box lunch today, and then Reed will be back for box lunch on Friday. So that's all the promotion that we have to do. Tom. Well, I, I, you know, look, I wanted to get into the other day, and we didn't have time because he wasn't ready yet, knowing that, you know, they changed uh, box lunch, didn't have it Monday. Yes. And, Casey, I asked you to sort of use me and off the bench, us, as, as sort of a sounding board. So let's pretend that no one is in this room Besides just you and you're giving a presentation to say, you know, one or two people instead of thousands watching right now, right? Give us your one or two top reasons that you have come to the conclusion that Geno Smith is a top 10 NFL quarterback. He is the reigning comeback player of the year in the National Football League. So just give us a sneak preview. Well, if I were to give a sneak preview. Just a sneak preview. Don't give everything away. I don't away. want to ruin it for box lunch. No, I don't want to do no. that. I would, never, I would never think of doing that. But um, I think he is, he is very misunderstood. I mean, his rookie year was 2013. Okay. Um, played on a very bad Jets team. And I'll get into more on that later. Right. But this year in particular, in particular, um, actually, if you look at the numbers from his past, you might have actually been able to see this one coming, honestly. Because I, agree, there, I agree with you on that. There are some numbers that actually back up the fact that he, he could actually sling the ball around. He just needed a little more talent, leadership, and a uh, play caller that knew what he was doing. So that, that those things culminate that um, make him a top 10 quarterback. And virtually almost every statistic that I'm going to go over in the show here coming soon. Okay. Um, he's a top five quarterback in. And I what? Put, he's virtually a top five quarterback in almost every stat that has some meaning. In the NFL currently. Are you talking about last year? In, in one season in, in, last in, year. In, in one season last year. Okay. And in fairness, I mean, look, you can't penalize a guy if he's on the bench. I never understood why somebody else didn't give this guy a chance before last year. I, I, I really don't because I'm with you. I'd always kind of look at some of this stuff and I'd be thinking to myself, well, wait a minute. I'm like, you know, this guy's gotten a second chance, third chance, fourth chance. Same with this guy, this guy, this guy. I mean, think a guy like Baker Mayfield. What makes him any more worthy, right? Yeah, the one year he took Cleveland to the playoffs, okay. But I'm just picking him out of a hat. What, what, what makes him any more worthy than Geno Smith? And Smith has to sit around for four, five, six years as a backup and never get a chance to go somewhere else. Maybe it's just you're kind of stuck somewhere, right? Yeah, and let's be real here. The Jets are right – they're barely ahead of the Browns in terms of stinking – since the early 2010s. No question. I mean, they stinked. Stink. Stunk. They were stunk. They, they, they were bad. I mean, it's not – I mean, all you got to do is look at Zach Wilson, what he's done with the talent that he has around him last year. And you know, they just – there's something there that they can't develop quarterbacks. They got to get a guy like Aaron Rodgers to do anything. But we, we don't even know how Aaron Rodgers is going to play with that team. I, I'm not – too hopeful for him honestly but Aaron Rodgers is washed is that what you're saying 
Jordan Jordan Love is washed. I wouldn't say that. It's not even really about that. I don't think, I don't think that the play calling is going to be great. I don't. I don't think anything that they showed last year should give anyone any inclination that this Jets team can can win a Super Bowl. And that's what everyone talks about. Everyone says that Aaron Rodgers is going to be a top five quarterback next year. That that he's going to win a lot of playoff games for them. He's going to compete against Josh Allen. He's going to be able to go toe to toe with Tua. And that's just I don't know. I, I don't. I don't buy it. I don't buy it because the Jets stink just as bad as the Browns do. Okay. But that's my – that. I don't even really get into that in my monologue. I focus on Geno and okay. what he's done. Okay. All right. I just wanted – because, uh, you know, we wanted to get into that on Monday. Uh, clearly, Red's conversation is dominating everything right now. Uh, Paul, you were uh, – you, I mean, you, 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 you say it in the chat instead of saying it to me. So you've turned into <laughs> one of these guys of your generation that you sit in the meeting across from somebody – but, and, I mean, I, this happened to me for the first time when I came back to work for the Reds. I'm sitting in a meeting, right, and somebody could say something to you, but somebody in the 20s generation or the 20-year-old generation, yeah, they're sending me a text across the room. Well, and I'm what, thinking to myself, are, are you kidding me? <laughs> well, what I was going to say was completely off topic, so All I was right. just well, letting then the what is it what Yeah, is it? I, was, right. I just didn't want to derail the Geno Smith conversation. All right, go ahead. Uh, but getting back to the Reds. Yes. Uh, my proposition for you, Tom, that has been popularized within the chat, instead of having to worry about shaving heads and everything else, if the Reds get to 15 wins, five more, will you drink a White Claw? No. Oh, <laughs> Tom. No. I'm not, no. No. That sounds like a great I deal. I have no that interest. That sounds like such I an easy no deal, Tom. I have no interest in a White Claw. It's the Braves and the Orbs. I am not going to get caught on video drinking a White Claw. Okay, we'll cover the can up. No free ads. We'll cover the can up, and the loyal people of the chat will get the inside joke. How about that? Uh, the answer is no. And Sir Boy Wonder has called me uh, weak. Everett has <laughs> called me a coward. Uh, but Darth Brando says Tom is very wise. So that's my – who's determining the chat rankings this week? Casey, is that back uh, to you or Paul on you? No, I think it's Reed. Oh, but Reed hasn't been here for a couple Reed of days. Reed hasn't been here for a couple of days, so we got to... I'll do it again. You want me to do it again? You want to do it again? Yeah, let me do it again. All right, Elliot's back. All right. Drew Garrison says, Tom, there are no laws. No laws when you're drinking White Claws. You can do whatever you want and can't be prosecuted. <laughs> Ain't no laws when you're drinking Claws, baby. That's as old as the hills. I just wanted to put something out there. They get to 15, we got to do something. Because if they get to 15, that means they'll have beaten – they'll have won today to get to 11. Then they'll swept the Braves. Well, I can tell you right now, and then looking the, at that starting rotation for the Reds this weekend against the Braves, that ain't happening. And then one against that the, is not the happening. Orioles? got to be something. I mean, we got to do something. You know, my, my dad is over row. in Europe. Um, he, he wanted to try and figure it out with the time difference. I don't know where he is now. It's his anniversary. So happy anniversary, Dad and uh, Amanda. Um, and um, they got married up at the Blind Lemon. Best spot in town. Uh, anyway. Um, they got married at the Blind Lemon? They did. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And uh, my dear friend, Eddie Shepard, and his wife, Pat, who owned that place. Uh, yeah, it was great. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, he's over. He was last seen, I think, in Prague. He's made his way now somewhere in Germany. Somewhere. Uh, but anyway, a lot of people have asked me. Had a real nice chat last night uh, with Kevin uh, on Twitter last night. And he says, now, Tom, uh, are you going to shave your head? I said, nope. My hair is falling out the old-fashioned way. Quickly. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to put you up to having to shave your head. I get no, that. No, and it's it's been done. No, I don't want to say it's. I t- wouldn't have shaved my head. Well, no, I might have shaved my head if our if our son won uh, the um, state championship in lacrosse this year. But but outside of that, nothing, zero Bengals, none of it. What about Casey? Would you shave your head if the Bengals won the Super Bowl this year? Ooh. Is there anything Ooh. you wouldn't do if the Bengals? Casey, I can't even believe could, you didn't answer could, yeah, that, how like, that right yeah. now. If if I could if I could get a Bengals, no, you're you're saying if they win it. I'm. I, are you asking if I shave my head, will they win a Super Bowl? Or no, I'm saying if they win the Super Bowl, would you shave your head? 
I mean, yes I would, I would no. shave my head for them to win a Super Bowl for sure. So why not? Why not? I mean, get, you, brother. The answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. Ride, ride I mean, the wave. We'll all be bald after the Bengals. What about a tattoo, yeah. Casey? The answer is yes. What about a tattoo, Casey? Where specifically? I mean, uh, it doesn't matter. Doesn't me, matter. It, yeah, it, you can but... pick the spot. That's I mean, a yes. Yeah, I mean, yes. That's yes. a yes. I will that, say I would not shave my head immediately because I have a, a wedding the next Saturday. So I would not shave my head immediately. But I would I would absolutely shave my head. That L-V-I-I-I would be real point. big right across my chest. Oh, uh, yeah, there we go. Well, I got to leave room wow. for more, right? You got to leave room for extra Super Bowls. Nothing's so, bigger than the first one. Oh, my God. I suppose. I suppose you're right. PB's Ghost says if the Bengals win the Super Bowl, Casey has to wear a loincloth and the Viking helmet on Fountain Square. <laughs> how'd you feel I, about that i'd do it i'll go I'll, I'll even wear i'll don black and orange paint stripes all over my body as well just to prove a point you should just do that to a game maybe i might just you know do that what to a that's game. a great point if Jake, we get a home I afc championship year, all right let me ask you this if we buy you tickets yeah so you and alex can go her knee hopefully is all healed up by then, uh, if we were to buy you tickets and said to you, we're going to get, and they're going to be big league tickets, not going to be some minor league stuff like you're used to sitting in. Okay, it's going to be big league tickets. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Would you go with the loincloth, the Viking helmet, and no shirt in the stands for at least a half of the game? If it's warm enough. I'm not asking you to do it when it's 25 degrees. I'm saying if it's in October. Nice no, night, I, September, something I'd like that. I'd do it for the full game. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I would do that. I don't know. It, I, it might be public indecency, but, I mean. Or public yeah. offense. That, that, too. Yeah. That, too. Tom, you can speak for yourself. I want Casey out there in late January in a playoff game when it's 20 degrees in that loincloth and Viking helmet. I can see him doing it. I could do it. I would do it. As long as I have plenty, <laughs> plenty to drink, because I gotta stay warm <laughs> somehow, right? I gotta get like four or five beers in me before I go in there. Feel really good. Just completely forget about the cold weather. Just enjoy myself watching the game. I tell you what I did years ago, and I've got to dig up the picture. Um, years ago, when I was doing NFL games for Fox, we used to have a charity event every year uh, uh, for our schools out in Marymount, and. Uh, we had a guy in the neighborhood who had a, had a private plane. And he would donate the plane. And eight guys would bid. I mean, it could be one guy bidding, and he just brings along seven people. But it was ten people on the trip, and I was one, and then you had nine others, okay? And they would be able to travel with me to an NFL game. And I always just tell them all the time, I'm like, fellas, there's really only two cities to go to. And, and obviously, I'd have to get a game in one of those two cities assigned by Fox. They would be Green Bay and New Orleans. Those are the, th those are the two spots. That's where you want to go. There are a lot of the great places, but those are the two spots. Okay? So, uh, I was working with Brian Billick at the time, and, and I get assigned a game in Green Bay. We get it all lined up. Off we go to Green Bay, right? So, now we're going to tape the open of the telecast. And Billick and I decided that we wanted to do the open not from the booth. We wanted to do it sitting on top of where you do the Lambeau Leap. <laughs> right? Yeah. So we had worked it out with the Packers that we could bring in early to tape it about 20 fans. Just we're out in the parking lot. We grab them and say, hey, come on. You're going to be on TV today. Come on. But, but the other nine were my buddies. And so I said, fellas, here's the deal. I told them when we got on the plane. I said, here's the deal. I said... We're going to do this. It was about five degrees. I said, and all of you guys have to take off your shirts. And, and like the rest of these Packer fans, these guys, and all the, you know, the hats and the whole deal. Yeah. And you're going to be on television. Right around Billick and me. And these guys are looking at me like, are you kidding me? I'm like, that's a deal. If you don't do it, no tickets to the game. You're out. You can watch <laughs> it from the bar. So when that open came on, my wife texted me, who was sitting with about six or seven of the wives of the guys on that trip. I think they were scarred for life seeing their husbands with their shirts off on Fox television. <laughs> scarred for life. And 
there's a lot of drinking. Those games are at noon. In what year was this, Tom? This was – I've got the picture somewhere in here. I've got a whole bunch of them. I'll have to find it, and we'll put it up sometime. But, God, was it funny. I mean, it was really funny. Um, and you guys ever been to Green Bay for a football game? No, I've not. Paul? I've been to Lambeau, but I've not been there for a football Fellas? game. Fellas? I've nope. not. I mean – Would love to. It, that, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's just insane. It's insane. Okay. Um, what else we need to cover here? Because we're going to spend probably a good solid 45 minutes, I would guess, with uh, Sid Ziegler. What else we got to cover here before we, we go any further? Worried about the Cubbies? No. Why? I, 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 I don't. Why are you not worried about the <laughs> I mean, I'll say it. I'll say it. They I am, won I am seven concerned in a row. about the Cubbies. Yes. You're concerned? Why are you concerned? I'm not about like. Them? I think. I think if you're looking at the Reds and saying, are the Reds going to be sustainable enough? Like, who in this division? I guess the only thing would be you get to the trade deadline and you say, <laughs> are one of these teams going to just s- sell off? <clears throat> like, are you going to get to the July 31st and the Brewers are going to sell some guys off or the Cubs are going to sell? Who, who – Who's going to decide? Somebody, at least one of these teams is going to decide to go for it. Because it's clear that the Reds are, right. as long as they keep this up. But it seems like it seems like the Reds are in a position now, the way Nick Kroll is talking, that the Reds are in a position that they're going to go for it yep. this year. And by go for it, I mean they're not going to, like, trade prospects away or trade anybody that matters to this year's team away. Steve I'm Ross not, says the Cubs, if they improve the bullpen, they have a chance to be really good. I'm, I'm right. just saying I'm not going to write – I'm not going to sit here and be ignorant and totally write the Cubs off because the Cubs are playing pretty well. They're playing just as well as the Reds are right now. Almost. They've won seven in a row. But over the long haul. Over the long haul. Over the last 15, 18 games. I mean, I'm just calling it like it is. That's exactly right. Gentlemen, worries about the Cubs? If you're concerned about the Cubs, I think you have to be concerned about the Brewers. You have to be concerned about the Cardinals. You have to be concerned about everybody. I I, I think – I think – the, I mean, the Cubs just straight up aren't good. I, they're not good. They have, a pay, they have a very high payroll. They've underperformed. I think if, if they continue this trend, they're going to sell at the deadline. I think they're going to quit. That's my thoughts, at least. I, I, and by the way, we've beaten the Cubs this year. I, 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 I'm, out of all the teams in the division, the Cubs are the least of my worries right now. Okay, really? so which, Cardinals are – like, Well, they can't, be, they can't be beneath Pittsburgh. They, okay, well, no, yeah, nobody – I don't even count them as a real, a okay. real franchise. Right. I, okay. the, the, Cardinals, the Cardinals lineup is, is the best in, the, in the, the, the division still. The Brewers pitching is the best in the division. The Cubs are not best at anything in the division. That's just a fact. I think they've, under, they've underperformed massively that, so far. Uh, yeah, no, I agree. I, I think, you know – with the current trajectory of the Cubs, it doesn't look like they're going to sell. But, you know, we still have a couple series to go before the deadline. So, you know, you, anything could happen. If they dump, you know, Bellinger, you know, Stroman, a couple relievers, whatever, they're not going to be competitive at all. And that, that's my question. Like, if the Cubs just decide, ah, we're, we're, what are we really it's doing this year? Yeah. yeah. If it's just, hey, what are we really doing this year? Are we just treading water? And what's the point of maybe going for it to potentially – Sneak in the division or whatever, eh? But that's what I'm saying. I, I, I and if they decide to do that, then obviously you're not worried about position them. where we are in the sense of anything we buy now, we're looking into the future. They yeah. kind of have this year only. Yeah, and a lot yes. of these deals. Are All expired. right, but let me ask you this though, and we're going to get to Sid Ziegler here in a minute. Let me ask you this final question, and we will we will address this at the end of the show today. If you had to take today, not what they've done so far this year. Today, starting rotations as they're made up of today. And I'm going to let you put Hunter Green in the Reds rotation. I'm not going to let you put Lodolo in there. Milwaukee, the Cardinals, the Cubs, and the Reds. Rank them in what order you would put them in as far as strongest to weakest over the final 100 games of the year. All right? Fair enough? Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I, I, I'm going to go Cardinals one still. The Cardinals are bad right now. They are. But the Cardinals do this thing after the deadline where they just out, outperform everybody in the division. I'm going to take Cardinals one. I'm going to take the Reds second, Brewers third, Cubs fourth. All right. We'll get everybody else's opinion uh, coming up. Um, okay. We've been talking about this for the better part of a week and a half. Sid Ziegler uh, is a lot of things. He's a commentator. He's an author in the field of sexuality and athletics in 2007. 
He founded Outsports.com. It's considered to be the leading website for men and women gay athletes, whether it's high school, college, uh, Olympics, professional sports. Former track star in high school, went to Stanford University. He's appeared on CNN, MSNBC, written for Sports Illustrated, the New York Times. He is credited with breaking the story of NBA player John Amici's coming out in 2017 and NFL player Michael Sam. Remember that story? That was a huge story. He himself is a gay man, married, living in Los Angeles. He's been recently criticized by many in the LGBTQ community for endorsing Ron DeSantis in the upcoming presidential election. We'll get to that a little bit later on. And I'm also going to say the most important part for me about Sid Ziegler is he has become my friend. Uh, as we celebrate Pride Month in the United States of America, it is a pleasure to welcome in the main man at Outsports.com, among many, many other things. Bright and early out there in L.A., Sid Ziegler, good morning. How are you? Got my cup of coffee. We'll be just fine. Um, how's life in general going? You doing all right? Tom, my life is perfect. I have this beautiful home in the best city in the world. My husband is so good to me. I have the two cutest cats. Every day I get to write about the most inspiring people and controversial topics in sports. I, what else could I ask for? Why would someone who's gay be considered a controversial uh, figure? What do you mean? Well, what about when you said about some of the most controversial, you, you probably meant more topics, and we'll get to some of those in a minute from now. Uh, yeah. But, 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 you know, the one thing that, that, that I was thinking of, you know, before we get to this, I, I want to go back to a second. When, when you were a young man growing up uh, in the East Coast, and you're this big track star, and I ask you this question point blank because there's a man in my neighborhood, gay man in my neighborhood, that after I said what I said and, and started to spend more time around gay men, he said to me, he said, you know, he said, I'll never forget as long as I live. He said, I was a homecoming king at my high school. And he said, I'm looking around and I'm thinking, man, I've got everybody fooled here. Nobody knows that I'm gay. I know that I'm gay. Nobody else knows. I'm the big football star running back. I'm the big star on the lacrosse team. I'm the best player on the basketball team. But he's walking around and carrying that. I'd imagine you went through the same thing and so many millions of others do the same today as we speak. When I was a kid, I was teased for being gay. Started in fourth grade. I refused to kiss this girl and, you know, nine-year-olds, the way they think, suddenly <laughs> I'm gay. And that stuck with me for years. And I'll tell you, the teasing started fading away in ninth grade when I started winning track meets in 10th grade when I started setting school records and MVP of teams, um, as I excelled in sports, the gay teasing went away. And I, I found that sports was a great place to hide. Ryan O'Callaghan, I had the fortune of writing his book. He was a, a former Patriot, played in the Super Bowl with the Patriots. Uh, he talks about that, how football was his beard. Football was the way that he hid being gay because if he was a six foot five, 300 pound lineman who could crush you with his hands, there's no way that you're gonna tease him for being gay. So that was an early lesson in my life. When you, when you look at um, inclusion in sports, um, you know, I liken this in many ways and maybe you will completely disagree with this. But, but sports is the one area, and, you know, you go back to people who were oppressed in, in, in different ways, right? Um, slighted in different ways, uh, persecuted in different ways. And in baseball, right, Jackie Robinson breaks a color barrier, uh, and, and, and all the sports subsequently follow. I've always believed that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether you're white, black, green, gay, or straight. Athletics is the one area of this country and this world where the very best athletes will play and all the other stuff is secondary. Am I right or wrong on that? Or have we not gotten to that point yet? Tom, I'll go even further than you go. 
We at Outsports have told the stories of LGBT athletes for, all, for over 20 years. And we have found essentially every one of them has the same story when they come out. They were scared to death to come out to their teammates and their coaches because they were told that athletes are homophobic, they're Neanderthals, they hate gay people. And it's because of what the media tells them. It's because of some of the language they hear in around the locker room. When they come out to their teammates, they are shocked at the level of support that they receive. And their only regret is they didn't do it sooner. And you, you talk about, you know, sports is where the greatest athletes come to play. We have found this to be true, whether they're the greatest player on the team or they ride the bench. Sports, a sports team is a place where people come together and they put aside what makes them different and they focus on what makes them the same. They're all they're all teammates. They all have the same goals. And our study we did in 2001, we looked at a, a, a thousand coming out experiences in sports in North America. And 5% and of them said that they had a negative experience, but 95% said they didn't. That 90, it's hard to get 95% of the people to agree the earth is round. Right. So I have said for years that absolutely sports Sports get a really bad rap because of some of the language in and around sports. Um, you know, I, I, I got to thinking, and I'm sitting here uh, as you and I were, were leading up to this conversation, and, and I'm wondering if, okay, if, if you have a great athlete who happens to be gay, does them being way gay and the story and, and, and people wanting to write about or talk about or ask about, does a gay athlete feel like, hey, man, I, I don't need to talk about that. I'm just trying to go out and get three hits today. I'm just trying to go out and score 22 points today. That's what I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I, 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 I... I think in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a perfect world, people wouldn't have to come out and this wouldn't be a big story. We look at the difference between how male athletes who come out are treated and female athletes. And female athletes who are out, I mean, I just talked to the general manager of the Las Vegas Aces who's gay. I didn't even know she was gay and she's been out for 20 years because being gay in women's sports, particularly today after so many athletes, so many superstars, Abby Wambach, Megan Rapino, Super, Diana Taurasi, Brittany Griner, they've all come out. It's just not a story anymore. And for us in the men's sports world to get to the point where it's not a story anymore, we just need more of them to come out. There's no other way to get to that place than some men like Carl Nassib and Michael Sam and Ryan O'Callaghan and Jason Collins are going to have to talk about it. They're going to be topics of sports conversations on the radio, on any covers of magazines, and it will change. These, the, the focus on this will go away over time. It just, a, a big time male athlete coming out is still news because it's still new. You know, I, I'm kind of curious. You talk about some of the pioneers, and I'm going to forget some of the names, but whether you're talking about Billie Jean King or Martina Navratilova, Greg Louganis, Billy Bean, who I, I've gotten to know quite well, the Billy Bean who's at Major League Baseball and the right-hand man of, uh, of Ma Rob Manfred, the commissioner there, and they all share their stories. I thought the NASIB thing, and, and, and you forgot more about it than I know, but because of the very nature of the sport in the game, uh, to me, I thought that had... Uh, the most significant impact, perhaps, of this generation. Do you think that's a fair statement? Jason Collins was big because he was yeah. the first cover of Sports Illustrated. But the NFL is king. I say all the time, football is the most powerful cultural institution in America. And when you have a football player coming out in America, it's just treated differently. Plus, the way his story panned out, he, he, he played, had a super successful first game with the Raiders after coming out. Um, he gets signed by the Bucs after that. His story has just panned out really well. Where are we right now in terms of relations, just in general, uh, of the public uh, and their feelings toward the LGBTQ community? I, I, I read a story, I think that the, uh, the, the poll came out yesterday, where the, for, for, for the first time in 
couple of decades or maybe a decade, um, th- there was a drop, if I read this poll correctly, and I'm sure you know the one I'm talking about, there, there was a drop in the acceptance level where certainly I think the most of us, we feel like there's been a gain in the acceptance level. Now, this was only one poll. But do you know the poll I'm talking about? And if so, what, what were your – I think it was a Pew Report poll. Maybe I'm wrong. I think it was Gallup, and, oh, Gallup. and it, okay. it showed that uh, support for transgender athletes has deteriorated a okay. lot. Uh, and that the, the – the, the, uh, the, people say – more and more people today than last year and the year before say that – um, a same-sex relationship isn't moral. And I think what I've seen, you know, talking to people, um, talking to particularly conservatives, Republicans, the LGBTQ community is all looked at as one. And there is rising disagreement with the T and maybe the Q part of that. And I think that the acceptance of same-sex relationships is getting kind of lumped in with, okay, uh, you, you want transgender girl to race against girls um but she used to be a boy i don't agree with that and so i'm just going to throw my support for all of it out i think there is some of that happening unfortunately well i don't think there's any doubt about it and Sid, that's where i was going to go with you here on this thing because that is the single biggest topic right now that there is uh in sports uh and it started with leah thomas a swimmer got all the pub was breaking all the records um, you know, in preparation of this interview, I, I try to dig as deep as I could and, and, and read opinions on both sides. Uh, there are many in the LGBTQ community who feel like there's not enough science out there um, that could tell you that a male has an advantage, a, a biological male, ha- even though they, they, they have transitioned into being a woman, um, does not have an advantage uh, over a female. Uh, we've seen Riley Gaines and some of these young ladies come out. And anybody who's a father that's raised a daughter that competes in athletics, uh, they say to themselves, look, I don't need any science to tell me that there is an advantage for the Leah Thomases of the world. What, what, is there a right answer? What's your opinion on what should happen here? So I would I'd say a couple things. For number one, we focus on Leah Thomas, um, and a couple other athletes, Austin Killips right now is a transgender cyclist who is winning a bunch of races in, in women's cycling. We focus on these big stories. And one of the things that I would ask you to do is also consider Erica Smith on the field hockey team at Sweet, Sweetbriar College, who's not good. Uh, she's lovely, lovely human being, but she's not good. And I've written about a lot of transgender athletes who are not winning and aren't even close to winning. So I, I want to I, I acknowledge that not every transgender athlete wins. The other part you asked me is about there's confusion, intentional confusion about, oh, there's no real science saying that transgender women have an advantage over cisgender women. L- let's be very clear about this. Without transitioning, without medical transition, on the average, a, a, a transgender woman is faster than a cisgender woman. Without transition, without medical transition, the fastest transgender woman is faster than the, the fastest cisgender woman oh, as a whole. What we don't have a lot of research about and science about is what happens to trans athletes' bodies when they transition over a year, over two years, over three years. That is what we don't have a lot of science about. And so to, to just say that a transgender athlete doesn't have an advantage without without transitioning, on average, they clearly do. And that's why I am a, a strong proponent that you have to have transition requirements you, and they and they have to be really strong requirements. Would you be in favor of, you know, some have said, hey, look. Uh, we're all on board with these men and women who are making decisions about what it is and how it is they want to identify. That, that, that's okay. But when it comes to competing, whether it be at the college level, whether it be at the high school level, whether it be especially in the Olympic Games, um, w- w- would you be in favor of having, say, three different categories? So you would have biological men who identify as men, biological women who identify as women, and then those who uh, identify 
with the other sex? Should there be a third category, in other words, for this kind of competition? Like you said, sports is different from everything else. So when we look at academics, employment, housing, public accommodations, transgender women are women. And I understand that's hard for people to understand. But, you know, when you look at Christina Carl, a sports editor of the San Francisco Chronicle, who's, who's a trans woman, to, to say that Christina is no woman is, is ridiculous. And to call her he, it's just, it's just, that's just people being cruel. In, like you said, sports are different. They're just different from the rest of society. We, we have all agreed that discrimination in sports is okay, based on sex. If, if you are a man, you cannot play in, in the women's category. We have all agreed that to preserve opportunities for women, there have to be restrictions in the women's category. What you bring up is really interesting because even though we're talking about transgender athletes right now, I think the bigger issue that is going to come is non-binary athletes. What if you have someone who doesn't say, I was a boy and now I'm a girl. They say, I'm neither of those things and I wanna just pick the category that I compete in. The, the New York Marathon has created a non-binary category and we're starting to see this happen more and more. 20% um, of youth today identify as LGBTQ and a good amount of that is the T and the non-binary. So as this number increases, we have to find some kind of accommodation and I am a proponent of creating more opportunities for people to compete, more opportunities for people to win. I look at what they're trying to do with the Oscars right now, re remove gender categories. Why would you remove opportunities for people because some people don't fit into those categories? So I'm generally in favor of, of, of finding ways for trans women to compete in the women's category. But as the number of trans and non-binary people increase, I, I see the benefits of creating more opportunities more and more. All right, I, I want to dive into, and this is hot button topic stuff. I, I, I mean, look, the, 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 and, and you, you, you talk about this kind of thing every day, is now when you add a third element to uh, LGBTQ and athletics, where I think we've made significant improvements, not perfect by any means, but you know, you, you, you've all but said that here. Now you bring in the cross-section to religion. Um, and in all of my conversations that I've been fortunate enough and blessed to, uh, enough to have, you know, I I'll have some people around me, Sid, and you've heard this before, where you get into the whole debate about, you know, uh, does the Bible tell you a man's got to be with a man or be with a woman? Man can't be with a man. Woman can't be with a woman. All this kind of stuff. Um, as it pertains to just the religious aspect of this, and a couple of people had some very interesting things to say to me about all of this. But I'm curious, you know, if you're just with someone, and take the theology part out, but they just say to you, you know, or, or a baseball player who says, my Christian beliefs just will not allow me to, quote, unquote, endorse wearing uh, a gay pride uniform. We're having pride night at our baseball uh, stadium. W what would you say to that person? So on July 30th, the Dodgers are having a Christian faith and family night. I am going to go and I'm going to wear a cross. Um, my... <clears throat> I have very, very close aunt and uncle who are born again Christians and, and, and to show them my support for them, I'm going to go and I'm going to wear a cross, even though I'm not a Christian because wearing a rainbow during pride night doesn't say, I think it's totally cool that two dudes are, are having sex with each other. All it says is I recognize that for decades, your community has been pushed out by the sports world. And I'm here to let you know you're welcome in the ballpark. That's really it. I understand that some people twist it into, oh, well, you're asking me to burn the Bible because you want me to wear a rainbow logo on my cap for one night. That's just not the intention. Um, baseball, uh, the, the commissioner of baseball has really started discouraging teams from wearing uh, these rainbows because of this small group of people who have this issue. But I'll tell you at Dodgers pride night on Friday with the drag nuns, sisters of perpetual indulgence being honored, Clayton Kershaw, 
who is deeply religious and is the reason that Christian Faith Night is coming to the Dodgers, Clayton Kershaw and every player of the Giants, every player of the Dodgers, and all the umpires were a rainbow cap because Clayton Kershaw is a great leader and he understands that you're not asking me to reject my religion. You're just asking me to welcome these people into the ballpark. That's it. I, I think you can't say it uh, any better than what you just did. But I, I want to follow up a little bit now, though, on this. The, the, the big story about that Dodger Pride Night was they invited this group, um, uh, the invitation to the Sisters of the uh, Perpetual Indulgence. They, they invite this group, which started a long, long time ago, and I'll let you, you know, fill in the blanks here. Uh, but basically, again, the, the, the intersection of all these moving parts, right? Uh, LGBTQ, Pride Night, athletics, religion, they all collide when this group is invited to be a part of it. The Dodgers initially uh, uh, invited them. They then uninvited them and then re-invited them again. And there was this massive protest by a number uh, of those in the Catholic faith who feel like, you know, th this group is, is being uh, incredibly... Um, uh, you know, bias in dressing up as nuns, but these outrageous sort of outfits they have on, at least according to those who are protesting. Um, what, what were your thoughts on that whole thing? So lost amongst the bad actors like Ron DeSantis, who previously mentioned, and Mike Pence, and Marco Rubio and a bunch of other people who just want to get a bunch of tweets um, about this. Lost and all that were some nuns who spoke out and said, we have no problem with this group. The reason is they're doing the work. The whole reason that the, 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 the sisters came about was back in the early 80s when the Catholic Church and the government turned their backs on dying gay men, particularly in San Francisco, dying of AIDS because they thought they were sinners and, and they're, they're killing themselves. It's their own fault. We don't want to go near them. When the Catholic Church turned their backs on their mission to help these people, the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence stepped in and in a lighthearted, satirical take on what the nuns should have been doing in San Francisco, they wore these... these fun garb and they went and they sat and they held the hands of gay men as they died of AIDS that the church refused to do. I'm sorry, the church has no standing with our community on this issue. There are few organizations in the world that have been more destructive to our community in the Catholic church. So I get that a bunch of people want to jump up and down and scream and, and, and cause hell about it. You apologize to our community for leaving us to die. Then we can talk. Um, when all was said and done, do you think, though, and, and, and when I asked you this question the other day, and you, you, you really surprised me about what, what your answer was. You know, look, I, I, I think, Sid, we can all agree that, that, that gay people don't want straight people mocking them or offending them. OK, and, and whether whatever form or fashion that might come in, um, I, I think we can all agree on that. I asked you the question the other day, wouldn't the Sisters of Perpetual Innocence, would they not be better served in getting out the message than to have to, to, to do something that is now going to offend another group? If we're all in the agreement that we just want to try to get along better. Are we not creating more issues by, by, on both sides of, of, of doing things that are just going almost out of our way knowing we're going to piss them off or offend them, whatever term you want to use? Tom, you know me. I'm not way over here or way over there. I'm pretty middle of the road. To be honest, the sisters, uh, they're not really my thing. I'm not a big fan of drag. I'm not going to sit here and jump up and down and scream about drag rights. Okay. It's just not, I work in the sports world. I'm, I'm, you know, I sometimes considered too conservative for my community. Fine. 
I get why some people are upset about it. But like I said, I don't think the sisters really care what the Catholic Church has to say. The Catholic Church's history and present on these issues is absolutely terrible. And, and, and oh, I, I just, the, the, the gay community ha has not over the years done horrible, life-threatening damage to the Catholic Church. The opposite is true. And if this group of people in a satirical, humorous way want to point that out, I just, I just don't think that they really care what the Catholic Church has to say about it. I'm sure they don't, they don't want to offend people. That's not their intention is to offend people, is to make light of it and, and in a satirical way, bring attention to what the Catholic Church has done to our community for so many years. All right, I, I want to get into uh, a couple of other topics here real quick where, you know, you ended up gay or straight, but in, in this case, gay. You hear somebody or read about somebody says something like I said or something like Bob Huggins said, and there have been many, many, many other men and women who have uttered a homophobic slur in some form or fashion, and it, it, it goes public. I told the story before you came on today how I had never met you, uh, and somebody sent me an article the day after I said what I said, and you wrote a column on Outsports.com and said, look, uh, we shouldn't fire this guy. You were at least willing to take three or four steps back away from the Bob Huggins thing when most of us in the world, people screaming to fire, people screaming that, hey, you know, whatever they were saying in defense of it, there is no defense of it. What is it for you that says, hold on a minute? And, and, and why, I, I got to be honest with you, I, you know, I'm not going to say you're in the minority on that, but at least as far as a vocal, maybe minority, maybe majority, uh, most people in the gay community want that person, I mean, hung out to dry immediately. Why are you different than, than, than some of them? Well, I've made mistakes and I continue to make mistakes and, and I don't think that when somebody makes a, a mistake, they said something or did something that either they didn't mean to, or in hindsight, they realize, wow, I shouldn't have done that. I just don't think people should lose their ability to feed their kids because they made a mistake. And for our community, you know, I could tell you a dozen different things that Tom Brenneman has now done to uh, to help the community, to understand the community. I can't tell you a single thing that your replacement has done. So why would we fire somebody who is now engaged in working with our community and sees the benefit of working for with our community? Why would we fire them and replace them with someone who doesn't do a darn thing for us. And I've found that whether it's you or Russell Turner, the UC Irvine basketball coach, or many other people, that's what happens when they realize they made a mistake, they wanna fix it. And I just think that to, 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 to fire you or, well, unfortunately, you know, you know, Bob made another big mistake and that's a whole other, that's a whole other issue, but, when you have somebody who wants to work with us and realizes they made a mistake, why fire somebody for a single mistake? It just, it, it strategically makes absolutely no sense. It is unhelpful. What do you want to see someone do? And I'm not just talking about a public figure. Let, let, let's say a high school kid. And in this day and age in social media, I mean, you know, you can say something, you and two or three of your buddies, and somebody nearby has a phone, and it ends up going out on the Internet immediately. If you were advising a young person who, who's made a mistake, uh, or you're the person they said it about, if you're a young person that's made a mistake, 
Let's start there. What, what would you advise that person to try and go do? Because for some people, it's never enough. You know that, and I know that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you do. It's never going to be enough for the rest of your life. You're never going to make everybody happy all the time. But what would you say to somebody like that that, 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 man, I really screwed up here. I know what I did was wrong. What's sort of my road back and what would be important for my road back? Well, the first thing is slow down as it feels like the whole world is crashing around you. Um, take a deep breath, everyone demanding your head, demanding an apology, demanding this and that. Just take a deep breath before you do anything. The, 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 the impulse is going to be to try to put out the fire immediately. Well, the fire, the fire is going to burn. So just, just let it, let, let it burn for a minute and listen is step two. You know, you said something, you know, start listening quickly to people in the community or, or what happened, like understand what the mistake was and understand what pain it brought. And then after you've listened and after you've taken some time, that, that time could be hours, it could be days, it just doesn't have to be right the second. There are so many different ways that you can demonstrate um, remorse or help the, the community. Anthony Edwards, the NBA player, um, you know, when, when he did what he did about nine months ago and he said, oh, I'm going to help the community. He hasn't done a darn thing. From what I can tell, everyone has said he hasn't. So find out what it is and, and, and wherever you are, whatever community is that, that you caused a problem for, talk to them. What, what do you want me to do? From it could be going and speaking at a school. Um, it could be, uh, it could be just you know, uh, being active on social media in support of the community. I, I I can't give you a specific roadmap because it's individual. But take a bit, take a breath, listen, and then based on that pause and that listening, find a course of action. All right. Uh, last thing I want to ask you a little bit about here, uh, and, and that uh, is. Um, your, um, you yourself now are in some hot water in the LGBTQ community. You came out and said that I am now a registered Republican and I'm endorsing Ron DeSantis for president of the United States. What has happened to you since making that declaration? Well, just a little bit of background. The, you know, like I said, I, I am pretty middle of the road guy. I have, uh, I am not a Donald Trump fan. <clears throat> I don't like him very much. Um, I, and I see him headed toward back toward the White House, <clears throat> and that doesn't make me super happy. I have to tell you, but, but what also doesn't make me happy is a lot of what the Democrats have done over the last six or seven years. They have unfortunately lost me, except for some issues like LGBT issues. I do agree with them more on. And when I talked about that, when I said that on Twitter about Ron DeSantis, uh, what I knew about DeSantis, what I liked about DeSantis was how he handled COVID. Living in Los Angeles, it was hell. The way that they, the way that they, treated COVID, the way that they treated individual rights was, I, I can't even tell you how horrible it was. Seeing Florida handled differently, that's what brought me to do that. What I had not realized, and I knew DeSantis had done a couple of things policy-wise about the LGBT community. I did not realize how he had really targeted my community. That was my fault for not being as as educated as I should have been. I knew there was a policy here about, you know, elementary school kids and and which was um, mischaracterized by a lot of people. And there were a couple of other things. But now I have learned how over the last six months, I understand why they were, my communities were angry with me because Ron DeSantis really has taken my community and put us I don't like to use violence terms, but in the crosshairs. Uh, 
and I wrote a lengthy column explaining this and saying, knowing what I know now, I cannot endorse that man. Even though I like what he did over here and over there, he really has become problematic for our community, unfortunately. So he's gone beyond just trying to protect eight-year-olds. So that's what happened. It was hell. What my community did, they tried to get me fired from my job. They tried to destroy my husband's business. They told my friends to unfriend me. They told athletes to no longer speak to me. Um, it was really bad. And it was, it was the, the cruelty that my own community showed me was in a lot of ways worse than any cruelty that I have experienced from the other side. Well, Sid, I can't thank you enough for your time today. I know it's really early out there in California. Again, the website is outsports.com. Uh, I would highly suggest you go read just some of the very personal stories about some of these incredible athletes and uh, what they've had to go through and what they've had to endure. Uh, and then, of course, the sacrifice they make just as a straight athlete to get uh, to the very top of their game. I thank you so much for your time today, young man, and hope you have a great day out there in sunny Southern California. I appreciate you talking about a lot, Tom. I really appreciate you. And if anybody out there is listening, if you have the opportunity to give this man another shot to do what he loves, I don't know what you're waiting for. Because what he has demonstrated is a love for our community. So I really, really hope that you get another shot, Tom. Sid, I appreciate it. Thank you, my friend. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. All right. Sid Ziegler, kind enough to join us from Southern California and Los Angeles. Again, the website is outsports.com. You know, the, the, the thing uh, that, uh, that I love about these kind of discussions is, is that, you know, you get people on both sides, um, and, and our chat today certainly is all about it. You'll get some people that are very, very upset, and I understand you getting upset about some of the things that, hey, look, Sid's his own man and has his own opinions. That doesn't mean they're my opinions, okay? Some of the things that he said uh, about the Catholic Church, th 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 those aren't my opinions. Those aren't my opinions. I'm a Christian man, okay, who makes mistakes just like everybody else. Uh, for those of you that, that, that want to go on and on, he pointed out a second ago there, okay? He pointed out a second ago there when he talked about the DeSantis thing. Some of you have have gotten uh, involved in this. He said himself that he was all in favor of DeSantis. And again, I'm not going to bat for this guy. I'm just trying to clean up some of the stuff that was going on in the check because i got to be honest with you. The overwhelming majority of it, I'm really disappointed. Um, I, I'm really disappointed. you got to step outside the box. What I was going to finish was he himself said, okay, that... He was all in favor of a lot of the stuff that DeSantis was doing in terms of uh, the books and so forth for kids that they're being exposed to. He liked that. He was talking about beyond that, again, in his opinion. Um, I'm not going to sit here and defend what, what he said about some of those in the Catholic Church. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it at all. I'm not going to do it. The idea of this was to try and bring to the forefront and at least hear the other side, okay, of different topics and things going on. You heard him say a little while ago, this transgender athlete thing, if you are the father of a daughter who is competing in sports and all of a sudden she's swimming against a biological male who now identifies and has every right to identify, I don't think anybody cares. I really don't. I don't think most people care if somebody wants to decide they identify as a woman or they identify as a man. I don't think anybody gets worked up about it. Where they get worked up about it is the intersection on what that does now to athletics. And you heard him say himself, again, just his opinion. He doesn't think that Thomas should be swimming against these young women and the effect it's had on Title IX. And all that kind of thing. So, you know, look, um, I'm not here to agree with everything he said, nor am I here to disagree with everything that he said. 
Um, I was offended by the group in, in, in Los Angeles. I was. I, I was offended by it, and I'm not Catholic. Uh, but he gave his reasons for what he thinks they are and how they came about and so on and so forth. So all we're trying to do here today is just take on a topic that a lot of people want to bury or just call each other bad names. And there's been a lot of that in this chat. Now, maybe some people, you know, they tune into the show because they want a sports talk show. Well, there's more to sports than the Reds won their 10th game in a row. There's more to sports than did Joe Burrow get a new contract extension. There's more to sports than how many hits did Ellie De La Cruz have. There's more to sports than that. There are a lot of other issues in sports that need to be discussed, need to be taken on head on and met head on and try to talk about with each other in a civil way. So if some of you don't want to come back tomorrow because of this discussion, don't come back. It's okay. You're allowed to think what you want to think. Each of us in this room is allowed to think what we want to think. It's okay. If you want to come back tomorrow when we're talking more about sports, like we just get this, I miss the good old days of sticking to sports. Well, okay. We did talk about sports today. We talked about what happened at a sporting event in Los Angeles. We talked about what happened to Leah Thomas. We got into some other things, yes. We talked about the high school or college athlete in studies that have been done by OutSports that has been a very positive thing for those athletes and the way they've been accepted in sports by their teammates or coaches or administrations or universities or high schools. So um, I don't know what to tell you. Ham and Eggers, take it away. It's that time of the show, the Ham and Eggers. These guys are great. Trust me, I would know. I introduce all the best segments. You know, not to, not to go down, not to have to, you know, have all this discussion on our own because I don't want to say anything, you know, without, without Tom sitting here and being able to add to the discussion. But I think the other thing, too, that, that we've talked about a lot here in sports recently is, you know, people always talk a lot about stick to sports or we want to do a sports talk show because it wants to be stick to sports or whatever it might be. But I think they're, the balance here in a discussion like this, too, is a lot of these athletes want to go out there and they want to play their sport and they don't want to have to feel like they're forced into taking a political stand on this on or on whatever issue it might be. It might be this. It might be whatever kind of political issue because – they might not feel like they know enough about the topic and then they get asked a question about whatever it might be and then they feel like they're obligated to answer or that a non-answer pins them into their own discussion. I think the, the biggest thing that is that has really come to the forefront in this with the whole stick to sports discussion is this kind of, I guess, dichotomy between figuring out where you stick to sports versus – these athletes that now have millions and millions of followers on Instagram or on Twitter or wherever they are on social media and feeling like they have a platform to be able to say something, but also not wanting to, I guess, make anybody upset or create any kind of a dissent within their own fan base because all they're really trying to do at the end of the day is go out and, and play the sport that they grew up and were trained to do and played to do have played their entire lives. I think now in 2023 with all these players throughout the country that have their own media, whether it's content creators or Instagram accounts or, or Twitter or whatever it is, a lot of players now these days, you know, they have the opportunity to speak out. They have the opportunity to uh, get invested in causes that they want to contribute to. And it, it, could be whatever it might be, but now all of a sudden you have this opportunity to talk about things like this and platforms like this, and and um, and then that's where you come back to this discussion about you know whether it's a sports talk show or whatever it might be that uh, you know that 
it's it's always that argument of of the the stick to sports versus not sticking to sports because there are as as you said Tom bigger things in the world than who wins or loses a baseball game or a football game or whatever it might be you know and and I really like this post here a second ago um by PB's ghost he says look these are tough things we have to talk about and if we don't get together we are doomed in society are there things that need changed on both sides no doubt I debated with Sid the other day off the air that and he says they don't care and so when somebody says something like that I don't know what else you come back and talk about but you're never going to get the person in this world who wrestles with, you know, the, the, the Christian who wrestles with, well, you know, I mean, look, the Pope has come out just in recent days and had a, a lot of support in the gay community, right, for the gay community, right? Um, and, and that's happened quite frequently with this Pope. Um, you're never going to get, though, the Christian who, who says to themselves, well, I read this verse or two in the Bible, right? And so I feel like my faith should put me there. But then I read in the Bible about God forgives all sinners, right? And God loves all people and we should love each other. The people who dress up as nuns in a satirical way, they are never going to win over the people I just described. It is never going to happen. And I said that to Sid the other day. I'm like, look, you know, if you want to try to find common ground with people, even if it's just based on the very premise of like he, he described Clayton Kershaw, just to try to get along. For people to get along and not call each other names, like the word I used, to, to, to not go out of their way to say something mean or do something mean, you are never going to get, you are never going to get people to buy into the satirical thing of, of making fun of nuns. You're never going to win them over. So to say that they don't care, okay, that's their right if they don't want to care. Um, I don't know. Um, I walked out of the room to run to the restroom. Uh, you guys want to add anything to this, or we just well, want to leave us alone entirely? No, I, all I said basically while you were out of the restroom is that now all these athletes and people have these platforms, and I think there is a, there is a, a bit of a dissension between trying to figure out for athletes – what they want to say, what they want to comment on when they're asked about it versus what they want to just do professionally, right? It, Tom, it feels like to me a lot of times you know, athletes feel like they have to come out and make a statement or they feel like they have to take a stand on whatever issue it is. I'm not speaking about any one particular issue, but I think a lot of athletes now are, are starting to get a little, um, I don't know, frustrated that they come out with whatever statement it might be, or if they get asked a question, they don't answer it the wrong way. You know, now you're in a situation where you have a, a platform as an athlete, whether it's on Twitter or, or on Instagram or whatever, YouTube, you have control of your own narrative. You have control of your own media to do and say whatever you want to do to have people think however they want to think about you. And we've never been in a situation like that forever because back in you know the 1970s 1980s if you had something you wanted to say you either called up the radio station and said you wanted to do an interview yep. or you called up the local beat writer or the local columnist and they came and interviewed you and put something in the paper and whoever read that article or listened to that interview was who heard your opinion and from there it's a game of telephone from other people that hear it and your opinion may get shared along the way. Now it's direct to consumer, right? If you have something that you want to say, you can put it out there in 10 seconds on Twitter or on Instagram or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think um, you're, you're starting to see that 
get into the larger discussion, and I say all of that as it relates to the the whole discussion at the crux of this, of the stick to sports, where a lot of these athletes feel like they have a platform. Not everybody, and I think that's fine. I think that's fine, and I, I, I think that I, I, I firmly believe that you don't have to have an opinion on everything. Like, if you grew up and you didn't pay attention to politics or you didn't pay attention to social justice or you didn't pay attention to all of this, you just played your sport, you minded your own business, you played your game, and you went out there and you just did your thing for 20 years and you did it to the best of your ability and so well that you're one of the best in the world at what you did, and then all of a sudden, you know, without men, much media training or maybe without much education on a topic, you get a camera thrown in your face at the professional level or on Twitter and you, you don't know how to respond, and then all of a sudden uh, the, the public you know, comes after you for whatever you said or, or maybe just by omission because you didn't know how to answer the question. It's okay and this goes, back, this goes back to what we talk about with hosting a sports show. It's okay to not have an opinion on everything. But I don't, I don't discredit the players or the media personalities or whoever it might be who have a platform who do speak out about things because that they feel like, whether it's sports or whatever, they feel like they can go out there and have a discussion about things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. True. Gentlemen, any thoughts about anything? Or are we good? Yeah, no, I agree. I agree with everything. I agree with everything Paul said. I think it's okay to, to disagree. I just think to keep it keep it respectful is the way to go. And I thought we've done that today. So that's what I've got. Yeah, nothing but echoing what these two have said. Okay. All right. Uh, Drew says he chooses to speak out for Pawnee Water. Mm. Right here. Natural limestone filtration. Well, I mean, where did you get that? We, we, I mean, I haven't seen a bottle of that laying around here and I don't know how long. Yeah. You guys are right across the street. If the Pawnee guys are listening, we could use another shipment, but we realized we were running low, so we kept one bottle for advertisement purposes. That's been right there in front of us. Got to make a, got to make a run to the local gas station. Maybe we're on our way to lunch. Although I'm not going to lunch today. Big day for Paulie today. Oh. Big day for Paulie. Big day. Yeah. Potentially the first thing today. What are this, you doing? Potentially this, the first day of the rest of my life. Tom. Life changing. What are you doing? At two thirty today, I'm going to get tested for the last time to see if I'm still allergic to peanuts. Oh really? Yeah. After you're like 23, you're not not. I don't want to say you're not supposed to get tested, but after like 20, 21, 22, you don't ever grow out of it anymore. And I haven't gotten tested in like 10 years, so we'll see. I am expecting nothing out of this, if I'm being completely honest, because it's the hardest one to grow out of, but it would be good. Yeah, I mean, because, uh, you know, look, I'm not trying to make you feel bad here, but because, I mean, for those of us that love peanuts and peanut butter, mm-hmm. man, I-, I hope you're all right. Uh, peanuts, kids that are allergic to peanuts are the worst. Like, yeah. I am the worst. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm like, a, like I, I, I am the worst. If you are allergic to peanuts... You're the worst, and well, I am the worst. It's the reason why they don't, they don't put them on airplanes anymore. Yeah. Because people who smell, I mean, that have it really, really, really bad. You have it, I mean, you don't have it, like, you could die bad. Well, I got, I got my well, happy. I mean, if you knocked out a bag of peanuts. But I'm saying, some people just, oh. if that stuff, get, you know, they open the little package on a plane, and, and, it, and, and the kid, it gets into the kid system just from smelling it, right? Yeah, that's how I always was. So when okay, I, when I right, was so back, you know what I'm talking when about. I was back in grade school, oh yeah, like it was, you know, if you're having a class party and somebody's opening a Reese's on the other side of the room, I'm out of that room. It was tough. I'm not like that anymore. If Casey was eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich right here next to me, I'd be fine. I'd be okay. I go to a ball game, I can sit in a seat that, you know, somebody was eating peanuts down below. I'd, I'd be okay. But as long as I don't eat it or, you know, if you took a knife and rub peanut butter up and down my arm. But the other thing is, I've never used my EpiPen, so all my friends think I'm, all my friends think I'm faking it. I'm telling you what, I'm not faking it. I know I'm not faking it, but we'll see. We'll see. I don't know. I'm, I'm not expecting much, but it'd be nice because it would open a lot of doors. At least, and correct me. Open if a lot of doors. How good is peanut butter, Tom? Well, you mean in that regard? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Not like career-wise. Okay. I was gonna say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm talking about culinary doors, Tom. Yeah, we, we, we might have to get into ball. a whole new form of discrimination if you were turned down for a job <laughs> because you had a peanut butter out. 
I mean, that's a deal breaker for a lot of people. I, I couldn't mean, be I, a taste tester. If you we ever think lucky, about that? Wow. If we get lucky, Paul should have to eat his first ever peanut butter and jelly sandwich on the show. If we get lucky. Oh, so funny. So they make like knockoff peanut butter sandwiches that supposedly, the, I don't know what it is. I don't know what the, I think, I forget what the butter, but it looks and smells like peanut butter, but it's actually not peanut butter. Right. So, yeah. So in college, somebody, somebody made me one of those and I was like, here, give that to me and I'll, I'll eat it in front of somebody that was afraid that, oh my, no, don't eat that. What are you doing? And I was like, you know, like, oh, my throat, you know, but no, I'm, I'm good. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it'll be like, I don't know. It's just so annoying. You get the, you open a package up and it says may contain peanuts and then you just got to say no. It's brutal. Not to go on about Well, me. we wish We've, you good luck on that today. Yeah, we'll see. Absolutely. We'll see. We wish you good luck. Uh, any final thoughts are you predicting? Does a winning streak, yay or nay, we go around the horn. Does a winning streak go to 11 in a row? And that one gets started in about 35 minutes from now. Yay or nay, Jacob, we begin with you. Give me a final score. The longest win streak for the Reds since 1957 happens tonight. 11 in a row, going 6-2, to two, no save situation. Diaz can take the night off. 11-0, 7-0. Wow. 11-0. Oh, God, look at this. Yeah. I'm saying uh, nine, three Reds. Uh, definitely a win. I'm going to give them eight to four. Man, you guys are piling up some big time runs here today. Clean sweep, yep. Tom. You got the Clean Reds tonight? Sweep. I, uh, yeah, I do. I do. I, I like Abbott a lot. Uh, I really wanted to ask Bud Black. But he's not seen Abbott in person. It's one thing to watch a guy on video, but people in, you know, really in any walk of life. I mean, it's one thing to see somebody do something in a video. And in the Rockies' case, they're trying to use that video to prepare facing Abbott. It's an entirely different thing to actually see that performer in person and to have to go up there and face him. Because in a lot of ways, now Abbott throws a little bit harder than Bud Black did, but they are very similar kinds of pitchers. I mean, Bud Black won 125 games and had a career ERA at 3.8. And that's when you had Mashers as a designated hitter. And he pitched virtually his entire career, almost all of it, in the American League. But he was a left-hander, good stuff, good control, good breaking ball, good changeup, located the fastball a lot like Abbott does. Be interested down the road, maybe we get Bud Black to come on and talk, um, talk a lot more about his career. Um, and what he thinks of um, Andrew Abbott. All right, do we have a cherry on top over there we, from Viking Land? We should. Casey, I sent it to you. Oh, no, wait. Do you have one? No, I have one. I sent it to you. Okay. This is a – this is an elite cherry on top. Really? Yeah. Well, I can't wait if it's elite. This is, this is something that, as a sports fan, you can only dream of. Check out this setup. TV. Imagine going outside and watching. Come on, is that real? Is this real? Yeah. Come on. Yes, that's real. Nah, I don't know if that's real. I, I don't, don't know. I think that's, I think that's a real. Mock. No way. That's 100% real. What are you talking about? Paul believes that's, everything he sees on buddy, the Buddy, that's not real. That's an animation. <laughs> Brody, that's 100% real. Uh, that is a mock. No, that's 100% <laughs> real. I am leaning fake. Jolly Jolly says, how did you guys get video of my backyard out here in L.A.? <laughs> It's a it's 100% real. No way. Come on. Maybe no? it is. I mean, come on. You guys are young. I mean, you've seen all this stuff before. So is Paul, allegedly. Does that look <laughs> real? Does that look real to you? No. My, my gut reaction was no. No, I think I saw that in SpongeBob. That was a <laughs> that's a similar cartoon I think they use in SpongeBob. It's I think it's I think it's fake, fellas. I think I think it's fake. But oh. but more importantly, Let's just let's just how sweet would it be? Oh. Yeah, let's just think about it. Let's just sit and marinate it in it for a you second. You can only have that in um, inland California. Couldn't do it near the ocean. 
Couldn't do that. The, the salt, the, the, the air, the whole, you couldn't, you got to be in. Uh, and you could do that um, somewhere like probably Texas, you could pull that off. Florida, again, if you're not near the water. Cincinnati, you might have a hard time with that. What do you, Arizona, you could certainly do it in Arizona. Yeah. We got a screen pretty close to that size, a couple parking lots over here in Hamilton. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, before we go, OJ's Bronco. Look, I, okay. All right. All right. Anyway, um, tomorrow we are uh, going to get back to sports, if you will. And um, we will obviously be talking about how the Reds do today. They will be off tomorrow. And then far more than the Houston series. Because Houston is beat up. We've talked about them already. They do not look like a playoff team. They may end up being one down the road. But when the Reds went in there, give them all the credit, they went in there and beat the defending world champs three in a row. They were not at full speed. The Atlanta Braves are a different outfit entirely. They are rolling in here on Friday with the best record in Major League Baseball in the month of June. They have got it going on. So, you know, I made the, the comment earlier, um, that red starting rotation really worries me uh, when you're not going to see Abbott, you're not going to see Green, you're not going to see, obviously, Lodolo, you're going to see guys like Lively and Williamson, and, uh, or not Lively, he pitched yesterday, but you're going to see, yeah, he'll pitch Sunday. See what, Williamson, who am I forgetting? Probably here? Weaver. 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 I mean, Luke Weaver, he allows five runs in five innings, but the game is always tied when he comes out. Yep. It's unbelievable. Dream Weaver, man. He's the best, worst pitcher in baseball. No doubt. He is, he's a 6 9 ERA, I think. He gives up five runs in five innings of work, but they win. They win every time he pitches. We have four or five of the best, worst pitchers in baseball. <laughs> I think that's true. I think that's very true. All right, boys. Uh, Casey, thank you. Paul, thank you. Yep. Jacob, Elliot, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, yeah. We got – Casey, you better get the Viking helmet off and find something with a Seahawk in it. Yep, I'm going to need something. I don't know what. Well, maybe I'll just wear this. Cause... Or one of the other three teams he's played for. Yeah. yeah. In his tumultuous yeah. career. The Geno Smith debate <sighs> is coming up next on Boxed Lunch. Gentlemen, here we go. I must admit, I didn't think much of this show the first time I laid eyes on it. Seemed like a bunch of stiffs wasting the nice worst microphones. The of all time happened back in 1803. Go ahead. Napoleon Bonaparte traded the Louisiana Purchase for $3 million. Napoleon, what happened? <laughs> Half the country for $3 million. You can't even get Tucker Barnhart for $3 million. And I came to realize anymore. these guys are funny. In Justin Fields have identical stats the last five weeks about throwing the football. This guy, okay, and folks, is a fidget spinner. And are some of the best spare. gamblers I've come to know. If you're betting on USC and or TCU, let it be known, you are a square. TCU is going to hammer this team tomorrow night. And I hate to hear that. Tomorrow when we afternoon. come back in here on Monday, you're going to be happy as a lark because USC lost, but you're going to be wrong about TCU. Get ready for the most useless hour of your day. It's time for Boxed Lunch, presented by Bet Fred Sportsbook. Now, Casey... Run that track. Hey, everybody. What's going on? Uh, so in between the break here, get this. I was with you guys on that TV being fake. That TV was real. I'm not buying. I'll send you the article unless this article. So I was with you guys. I sent that and I didn't prep you guys on that. Yeah. It says it's real. If you would have prepped us, we could have got Tom for sure. I know. I kind of gave you the eyes over there. Uh, it was too late. So it's the world's first foldable micro LED TV. It's 144 inches. This article was written to uh, last year. It was debuted in 2021 at some technology expo. 
and it looks exact. I mean, tell me that's not. Why would that? That looks real, right? Can confirm to the it looks yeah. real, but I think the thing you showed was still a mock. No, the video. I oh, that I don't know. I would agree with that. That I don't know. The Maybe, video, but the, there was a dog running across the screen. The TV <laughs> exists. You can't put a dog in a video. You're right. A cat. You got. Me. Why would you go through that effort? For people like you, Paul. Well, it's, say, it's still real, <laughs> and I want it. I wonder how much it costs. I wonder how much a TV like that costs. It probably doesn't even cost. You pr- you're probably giving it yeah. to, to promote it, right? Yeah, that, yeah. That, yeah. You're probably giving it to promote it's it. It's like the big red boots of technology. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to choose to believe it's real, whether it's real or not. This article makes it look real, though. Tell me that's not – did that not it look real? It looks real. looks real. Elliot, you – you're looking at me like Still has it doesn't look it doesn't look real. <laughs> <laughs> the mock did not look real. The mock did not look real. No. Okay. No, we're all in agreement on that. All right, everybody. This is Box Lunch. Casey, I I can't really hear uh I can't really hear myself. I don't know if that's I don't know if that's how Tom is. I I guess. I don't know. Okay. All right. Just to me. Okay. All right. Maybe Tom just rolls like this the whole show, which if he does, this is wild. <laughs> can you not hear yourself this at all? Wild. No, I can hear you guys, but to me, it sounds like I'm just talking out loud. That's wild. Good for Tom. Uh, okay, today we have something uh, very important to get to. We have 30 minutes right now. It's 12.05. We have 30 minutes to get through whether Geno Smith is a top 10 quarterback in the NFL. We're going to do that. In just a second, we have one topic to get to first, and that's the fact that the Cincinnati Reds have won 10 games in a row. We had a lot going on on off the bench today, so we really didn't get a ton into dissecting the Reds now having won 10 in a row. Jacob, you were there last night. I want to ask you something, Jacob, about after the game. Yes. The scene down the third base line at the Bally postgame show was incredible. I sent a selfie into our group chat, yeah. the four of us from, from right outside the, the deck there at Reds Live, and boy, oh boy, I don't know that I've ever seen it like that. After Ellie's debut, after Ellie's first home run, that, was, that Dodgers series, those post-game shows were unbelievable. But last night, I mean, it was shoulder to shoulder, clear from that metal railing, all the way back to the Porkopolis back behind there. You couldn't even get through to leave. Yeah. It, I mean, it was unbelievable. It looked fantastic, and the, like you said, there was – People on the second tier. Like, right. there were other fans up at the top. Correct. It, I mean, it was, it was crazy. The, the excitement around the – granted, I was 11 in 2012, so I don't know how much I can really speak on that, but this is by far the most excitement I've seen around the Reds in my lifetime. Yeah. It's, it's without question. I think it's even more so, and I know this is – people aren't going to like this take. I think this is crazier than what happened with the Bengals on the Super Bowl run. I genuinely believe – this team was supposed to roll over and die. They were predicted 64 wins. That is horrid. Horrid. They have come out here. They've won 10 in a row. They're going to go for 11 today, which I think they will get. The Rockies are respectfully, and I say that with all due respect, they're the worst team of all time on the road. They can't play, they can't play road games. Would be our longest they, win streak since 1957. Which is crazy. And, th- again, this team was never supposed to be good. The starting pitching is still not good. The, the, the offense is w- led by Kevin Newman, is, is fifth in the, in the majors in OBP. They're getting on base 33% of the time. This is unbelievable. It's unprecedented. It's, it's, it's my favorite time in my lifetime so far as, as, as a Cincinnati sports fan. I will agree with you on that Bengals take because at least the Bengals were good. Yeah. You knew they were going to be good. Maybe you didn't think they were going to go to the Super Bowl. The Bengals win total when we went to the Super Bowl was six and a half. Yeah, but I, I still think that if you, told, if you asked somebody before that Bengals season, given the roster that the Bengals had that year, and the roster that the Reds started with this year and said where they would be halfway through that season, I, I think you would it's, be more surprised at what the Reds have done than what the Bengals did, I, I think. The, the, roster, the rosters aren't even comparable. TJ Friedel was supposed to be a bum. And again, I, I, that's what people thought coming in. Nobody, nobody had high expectations for TJ Friedel. Jonathan India and Tyler Stevenson were supposed to be our best guys. India's lived up to it. Stevenson has underperformed this year. Uh, and, and I think it's just Ellie De La Cruz, Matt McClain. Nobody expected Matt McClain up. Matt McClain is up, and he's borderline an all-star. Jacob and I were having this debate yesterday. Alexis Diaz is now the, is the best closer in the National League. Is T.J. Friedel an all-star? T.J. Friedel's an all-star. I, 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 Nick Senzel is, is showing signs of life. That, I wrote him off completely. He's still not great, but he's, he's certainly, he's certainly com- competing. You know, and I, and I think with all the struggles that we've had over the years – I wrote this team off so long, so long before the season. 
Opening day, I, you know, this season was washed. I, th- there's no way anybody could have predicted this. This is historic right now. When we're we, living it. When we were sitting here about a week before the season, I remember we were doing a segment on this show or on Off the Bench about what the Reds were going to do. And I think this was right around when Reed gave his shtick about, you guys aren't going to win 65 ball games. <laughs> this was right around that. I remember we were sitting here doing the show, and Casey and I looked at each other after uh, one of the shows ended, and we said, we just spent 20 minutes talking about the Reds and what they could do this season as if, as if the major league season mattered. Because really what was going to matter this year was what the Louisville Bats did, or to an extent what the Chattanooga Lookouts did, yeah. and what their rosters looked like and how those players performed. And what happened at the major league level, I remember in 2021 when I was with the Orioles, I would see tweets from Orioles fans all the time of, of people getting mad at what was happening at Camden Yards or what was happening with the major league club and what was going on and, and losses and decisions. And I was sitting there the entire season thinking, none of that matters. Everybody that I'm watching right now, everybody that I'm broadcasting, everybody that's up at Norfolk at AAA – Those are the players that matter. Why is anybody getting mad about what's happening at the major league level right now? Brandon Hyde making this decision or that decision, whatever it might be. Why does any of that matter? And I remember sitting there thinking before the season this year, about a week before opening day, and we did 20 minutes on the Reds' win total. And I was sitting there thinking to myself, why are we even wasting our time doing this when in reality we know that all we're doing is – basically fast forwarding to 2024 we just have to exist to get to 2024 and now all of a sudden i think maybe i'm off base i'll I'll let you guys answer this do you guys think that the february idea of 2024 is now happening in 2023 is that what's happening right here oh i think so I, i think this 10 game right before this 10 game win streak the reds were in the mix for the division we were still talking about Hey, do you, do you buy a starting pitcher or whatever? After 10 wins in a row, this has gotten a lot more serious when it comes to being legitimate buyers at the deadline. Yeah. Because this team is proving that it's not, number one, a fluke. We're beating teams consistently. Number two, these young guys are just getting started. Yep. They have a long fuse. They have a big gas tank. They can play a lot of games. Like, we're not going to have to rest. The, I mean, Matt McClain has a day off today. You're going to have to sprinkle those throughout. But we have a lot of young guys that are very versatile – and are just now getting here. So it feels like the start of something special that's going to be going on for a decade or so. Yeah, I, I, I think right now is the, the window has opened. The door has opened a year early, and that's okay. I, I think at the deadline, I think this team is going to be good enough to compete. I mean, even watching last night when they were down, I mean, the, the offense is rolling so well. It's, it's flowing so well right now. There was never a doubt they were going to score three runs, four runs. Ellie De La Cruz hit a, hit a 98-mile-per-hour pop-up to left field, home run. I mean, the, the way we're winning these games is, is just crazy. Right now, we are, we are as good as we can be next year. I think next year will obviously be better. We're going to improve in the offseason. But right now, we are, we are a competitive playoff caliber team. No question about it. On that note, we're going to switch to whether Geno Smith is a top 10 quarterback in the National Football League. So this is how this is going to work. Oh God. Casey is going to come up here. We're going to switch cameras so that it's on these guys here for a second. Casey and I are going to switch seats so I can go over there and run the board. Casey will give his opening. Jacob will come up here. We'll all switch seats again, do a little fire drill here. Switch seats. Then we can go back to these seats and do rebuttals. I'll come back up here and moderate. And then we'll figure out Elliot and I. Just yeah, it'll be a. What happens if there's a tie? There's not a tie. We'll. we'll you guys got to pick a win. We'll come to a decision. Okay. All I right. am. I am going into this with a completely open mind. I would be I'll disappointed be, if you weren't. I'll be honest. I don't really have an opinion here. Okay. I do. I, <laughs> Elliot. This I'm is biased. Like the TV I'm thing. biased. He's arguing Geno Smith is better than Aaron Rodgers. I can't do it. This is like the TV gonna, thing. Casey. Casey, I'm going to try. Casey, I'm going to try my best to give you an honest vote. Listen, I know it's an uphill battle. I know, I know it's going to be tough. Yeah, it's straight uphill. But, my, but that is my goal, is to try to convince you and the rest of the chat that Juno Smith is deserving of a top 10 place. Well, let's get started here. Well, you also uh, – yeah. You know what? I'm not going to say anything. We, let's go. Let's do seat, this. In the let's seat do transition. This. Uh, do you want me to get up? You give I, some talk. 
Oh, yeah, you want yeah. me to talk in this? Okay. So, so let's go over betting lines. These betting lines are fake, so whatever I say is not real. Uh, I would personally have the, uh, have the line minus 3 million on Jacob, but, you know, there's some good value plus 200 trillion on Casey to win this debate. So take whatever one you feel. We're talking about chasing value earlier in the show. Yeah, we were. This is chasing value. If, if, if Fred is listening, yeah, we yeah, can yeah. get this up. Yeah. The chat can chase there's some real no, value here on Casey. There's not any better value in the world right now than on Casey. Would Casey be plus money if it was Geno Smith top 15? Yeah, I think he I would. I think so as well. I think he would. I think so as well. But we'll see. Casey, Casey has come prepared. I, oh, on. I'm holding on. We're getting close. We're getting close. Hey, we'll keep dribbling this clock out, Elliot. Yeah. think about <laughs> uh, you want to eat, eat, eat a cricket again? No, we don't. I don't. No, we don't need to do that. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> In the world of sports, certain athletes or topics are considered especially divisive. At Chatterbox Sports, the dedicated fans who debate these topics are Trace and Reed. Welcome to Box Court. Well, uh, I am not Trace or Reed. I am your favorite producer, Casey McCallister. Welcome, Nutcutter Nation. This is the first time I've had the opportunity to sit here and uh, hear the the mic issue here so that's interesting now that i get to finally hear what's going on I don't, <laughs> news flash it's not working the way it should be but anyways i know that this is going to be a tough and a very hard hill to climb up and it, it, it's it's almost impossible to even try to debate this but i'm going to do my best for the next 15 20 minutes i'm going to try to convince you that gino smith is a top 10 quarterback for this upcoming season. I'm not debating his career. I'm not debating that he's played very poorly at some points of his career, but there's a lot of circumstances surrounding that that make it very, very difficult for me to believe that you can really put all the onus on him, okay? So let's just start with the stats, right? And we're going to include his one playoff game, and I will annotate where it needs to, you know? Like, just as an example, the sacks this last season, he had, I think, 46 or something like that, but um, it was like 40 in the regular season. Anyways, let's get started. Juno Smith last year had a total of 32 passing touchdowns, fourth in the league. A total of 4,535 passing yards, ranking him eighth. Seventh, if you remove the postseason. Fourth in total air yards, 2,731 yards, meaning he's slinging the ball around. He's not dinking and dumping. And if we want to go into more bigger details, sorry, it's just, <laughs> this is very difficult to do when you're reading off this thing. Okay. PFF offers more detailed stats, like big time throws. A statistic that shows if you have excellent ball location, timing, and generally you're throwing the ball deep down the field, right? So big time throws. He was ranked second in this category in the entire NFL. Juno Smith was also the most accurate passer in the league. Oh, and not to mention, like I said before, he was sacked 46 times and pressured the sixth most in the league. 33% of the time he dropped back, he was getting pressured. Juno Smith was also working with one of the worst defenses that the Seattle Seahawks have ever had in the past 20 years, giving up high scores like 27 to the Falcons, 30 to the Panthers, 39 to the Saints, 40 to the Raiders, and 45 to the Lions. Oh, and by the way, he beat the Lions 48 to 45. Seattle was... 10th in scoring last year his defense the bottom quarter at 25th Geno Smith had to elevate the talent around him just to succeed so let's just look at Russell Wilson the year that he didn't start in 2021 right Russell Wilson went six and eight finished the year seven and ten now look People are going to point to DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. 
the two of those guys combined for 2,256 yards and 17 touchdowns. That's about half of Geno's numbers, okay? The rest, well, we're going to throw in four or five starters that averaged out about seven, 800 yards. And then he threw to, in total, 18 different players on the roster. He's not just targeting two or three guys and that's it. He is spreading the ball out, a sign of a true excellent passer. And listen, just about every statistical category that I've rattled off, he's either the same as Joe Burrow, meaning that they're four and five or five and four or better, which is really crazy. When I went to go digging into the true numbers, it's, it's nuts, right? This guy has been playing unbelievable. And the one thing that people are going to point to as to why he doesn't deserve to be in the top 10 is his past. And look, he's already admitted before he was an immature guy. He wasn't ready for the league. And his rookie season, you know, wasn't great. Or was it? If you look at Gino's rookie season, he was thrown into a dumpster fire, okay? He got drafted by the Jets. And we all know they stink. And let me tell you, the Jets roster, when he was drafted in 2013, just coming off of AFC championship, was completely stripped. No Darrell Revis. There was no, there was no LT. There was no Scroll down a little bit, okay? But anyways, right there, you're good. Unfortunately, though, Gino was thrown into the fire right away, his rookie season, with stripped-down talent. And I'll get into some of the weapons here in a second, but this would be the only year he had a fully healthy season. The only time he had a chance to showcase what he can do within a full year. His rookie season, he was sacked 43 times, pressured on 41% of his dropbacks. And despite this, Gino had very respectable PFF grades. And in terms of the stats I mentioned before, like big time throws, he threw them at a rate of 5%, which was ninth in the league. Not bad. Gino also had to fight against his own teammates, literally, getting slugged in the face at one point, breaking his jaw. But his rookie season, he had to compete with the, one of the highest drop rates in the league, seventh. Seventh. Throwing to guys like Kellen Winslow, Santonio Holmes, Jeremy Curley. Is that really pushing the envelope, guys? I don't think so. Well, let me say this. There was no consistency for him in his rookie season. Most of the playmakers were in and out of the lineup. They were ineffective. And his rookie season, his offensive coordinator, Tony Soprano, or, yeah, Soprano, I don't even know how to. <laughs> <laughs> Tony Sperano, not Soprano. Tony Sperano. <laughs> who was specifically hired to help him out in 2012, didn't even make it the full season, got fired midway through the season. Because of this, and because of the circumstances surrounding him, Gino had to fight uphill to succeed. And like I mentioned before, the Jets really stink. And they were not able to put enough talent around him to succeed. And so he gets shipped out. He doesn't get the fifth-year option. He goes and studies under quarterbacks like Eli Manning, Phillip Rivers, Russell Wilson, before learning what it truly takes to play quarterback at the NFL level. Let me just say this. Sometimes it takes a while for you to get it. 
and for it to click. He can't help the circumstances that he was put under, the things that plagued the start of his career. And I want to remind all of you that this is a conversation about Geno Smith being a top 10 quarterback next season. I'm not arguing about his career. It's pretty laughable if I were to do that. All right, red start in 10 minutes. <laughs> taking, the, taking the full half hour here, Casey. <laughs> See, we should have done this because I, I, I had so much here. But anyways. Keep going, Casey. Don't worry. Well, yeah, don't stop yeah, now. Go now. Don't now, stop now. Don't stop now. Let's go. I only got like five minutes. It's easy. Yeah, Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I got to take this off. This is so, it is just <laughs> so, dis- it is so distracting. It's so bad. Keep going. If you factor in the fact that Geno's team got much better this upcoming season and maybe got one of the best receivers in the NFL, creating a trio of receivers, I think that you can argue that he can become a top 10 quarterback this upcoming season. I mean, he's not really that far away from 11, 12, and 13. But if you look at the circumstances surrounding him, I think that you can make a reasonable argument that he deserves a top 10 spot. And that concludes my very, very poorly written no. out. Uh, Don't say it was poor. Casey, I think you did a great job. Don't say it was poor. It was good. You pointed <laughs> was, out a lot of stats that I was unaware of. It was good. It was – it would have been a lot better if... Uh... No, stop. Casey, just stop talking. It you did a good. good job. Don't deprecate yourself. It was good. All right. Jacob. Am I taking the chair or am I doing yeah, no, it from here? Yeah, no, you're up there. You're going, you're going Let's up go, there. baby. That's my horse. That's my horse. Don't put on the headset, by the way. It's very, it's yeah, very distracting. It's okay. Wait. I need to go... No, no, no. You, don't have to go, you don't have to go anywhere. I stay, I stay here. All right. Do you want to go over there so you guys can... Do the decision no, no, at the no, end. I'll just text him. Okay. I'll hit you up. <laughs> okay. Gentlemen, we've been waiting for this day for almost a full week now. When we initially said we were going to have a debate on whether Geno Smith was a top 10 quarterback in the NFL, I'm sure many of you smirked, laughed, maybe even guffawed at that comment. Well, I'm here today to prove you guys right. Geno Smith is nowhere near a top 10 quarterback in the league. If the debate was top 15, sure, let's have a conversation. Patrick Mahomes. Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, Trevor Lawrence, Lamar Jackson, Justin Herbert, Deshaun Watson, Aaron Rodgers, Jared Goff, Matthew Stafford, Tua Tungavailoa, Dak Prescott, and Justin Fields. That is 14 quarterbacks that I am ready to take over Geno Smith. Kirk Cousins last year went 14-3 and in the regular season, finished top five in passing yards with worse weapons than Geno Smith. Derek Carr entered the league after Geno, has more seasons above 3,000 yards, and also has a season where he led the league in MVP votes before he broke his leg. Geno Smith threw for his first season over 3,500 yards since his rookie year last year. Geno Smith is also over 30 years old. In Casey's quarterback's tier list, he had all the rookies at the bottom with guys such as Brock Purdy, who haven't had enough experience and haven't produced consistently enough to have a spot in the real rankings of the list. Geno Smith also only had one good year. But he had that one good year without the benefit of all those other young quarterbacks. He's now on an expensive contract, and he's an aging quarterback. The Seattle Seahawks were openly involved in the quarterback market all offseason, talking about if Anthony Richardson fell to five, they would jump on that opportunity. Would you be talking about taking a quarterback in the top 10 if you had a top 10 quarterback on your roster already? I don't think so. Forecasting beyond next season, Geno would easily fall outside of even the top 20 because of his age, his contract, and the way that roster is looking. Geno Smith had one good season. And at the end of the day, I don't think it's fair to put him above guys who have been doing this for years at a high level. And that is where I'll leave it. Okay. You guys go back in your chair. I'll go back up there. <laughs> and uh, you guys just have a little discussion. In case you have any, any, any thoughts on that? Um, I have a few different thoughts. Uh, um, you said that you would take 
the fidget spinner. No question. Liter- the the literal butt of the joke of this entire program on box lunch. You would la- you would rather take him than Geno Smith. Without a doubt, no question. Even after all the statistics that I had presented. Absolutely. Justin Fields is much younger. He had worse weapons last year, a worse O-line, and a worse defense. I mean, age, I don't think you should really factor in age in this conversation. I don't know how you could. It's literally just a conversation of who's going to be a good quarterback next season. I would expect the 30-year-old to be better already. He's playing at a top five level. In for one season. And he's going to have better talent. That is correct. So will Justin Fields. Hmm. And then you're going to take Kirk Cousins. That, yeah, that's not even a debate for me. They now, both lost I, in the first round of the playoffs. Kirk Cousins went 14-3 and three in, the, in the regular season. Yeah, he went 14-3, and three, but we all know that that was pretty fluky. You are when what your wins, record says you are, Casey. Huh? You are what your record says you are. Oh, sure, I get it. But he's not going to replicate that next season. There's I think no it's more he, likely that the Vikings go 14-3 and three again than Geno Smith having another top five year. Passing. I would take that bet. Let's do it right Let's now. Let's do it. Let's 50 bucks. What are we betting? What? Crickets? 50 bucks that Geno Smith has under 4,282 passing yards and the Vikings go at least 13-4. and four. Would, There's got to be a way we can get that. Bet Fred. No, me, I, I, I'm the not Casey, even, The Casey I'm Jacob even, wager. I'm not even going to – regardless of the actual passing number, let's just say that he makes it in the top five in passing numbers. Deal. And if we both lose, then nothing happens. Correct. Okay. All right. Now, the Vikings are going to be tragically just, you know, overrated here this season, but that's, that's okay. Um, you have Aaron Rodgers above him, which is fair. That's a fair argument. Two of the last three MVPs. Yeah, I, don't, I won't argue that. <laughs> He's my 11th quarterback. I just think the circumstances surrounding him are a little rough. He's won two of the last three MVPs, Casey. Yeah, I, I get that. I understand that. I'm not arguing that. I'm not arguing that at all, really. I'm just saying that the circumstances surrounding him, the talent that he's got around him, I don't think will shape up for a great season. That defense him. is one of the best in the league in New York. Yeah. With young superstars, maybe the best corner in the league. That offense has a top 15 receiver in the league in Garrett Wilson. That's top probably 15 running back in Brees Hall when he's healthy. Look what he did last year before he got hurt. That, that team in New York is, is going to be legit. Granted, they play in a tough division, and the AFC's a gauntlet, so who knows if they're going to make the playoffs, but Aaron Rodgers is going to have a good year. I, I doubt it. That offensive line is horrid, but who is your next quarterback? I have Rodgers, Jared Goff, Matthew Stafford, Tua Tungavailoa, Dak Prescott, and Justin Fields above Geno Smith. I won't argue Jared Goff, and Tua is really hard to argue just because of the injury thing. Absolutely. I, I just don't even – want to go there but if he was healthy i mean he might be mvp like just based couldn't agree more just based off of numbers alone but if you can't you can't factor in that in my opinion you can't you can't if you're gonna you can't project what he could have done if you're gonna knock tua for being out for injury you have to knock geno smith for being out for five years as being a backup no because he played a full season 20 seconds but anyways what was the last quarterback that i had a problem with was dak Two playoff wins. Yeah, out of how many that he's been, been G- to? Geno's 0 for 1 in less years. But he's got a much better offense. He's got a lot more talent. I don't know. I don't know That's about it. that one. We're going to have to call it. That's it. All right, we Elliot. Should've, we should have pushed this to Friday. There's so much to talk about. Well, but do we? Is there? So much to talk about. It, Elliot, do we, we have it? Is the, is, the, is the decision unanimous? I think I think there's a very clear and obvious winner here. All right. Three, two, one. Casey. Casey. Look at Casey that. Casey is the winner. Casey, oh, congratulations. Wow. Question, Casey, congratulations. Without question. Wow, what a victory. Wow. What a time to be alive. I think everybody saw that coming. Geno Smith. Geno I, Smith, certainly a top ten quarterback in I the National Football Casey sure League. is. Sure is. Has he won an award ever in the NFL, by the way? Come back <laughs> player of the year. I'm just trying yeah. to think of an award that Geno year. Smith has won in his ten year career as an NFL career backup. <laughs> so let's go here. Mahomes, Burrow, Allen, Hurts, Lawrence, Lamar, Herbert, Watson. So you have Geno Smith above 
Are you taking Rodgers above Geno? I would push Watson way down. Well, no, you, you of course you though. would, because you're. No, you wouldn't though. Okay, but I be would. honest. Okay. Yeah, you're only doing that for your show. If you're Brown trying to win, a, if, you, if you're trying to win a football game, though. Deshaun Watson. Yeah, I would, I would not take five. Deshaun Watson in my top fifteen. Casey. Not, not right now. Casey. Why would I take him right now? He's Casey. not shown anything last year. I mean, he Casey. might have lost it all last year. Casey. You guys I mean, are basing it based off of the monster lap. stole his power. Casey. Mm. What? So many are saying. What about Stafford? 60 touchdowns his last full year, Super Bowl champ. He looked pretty rough beginning of last year. He didn't play. He did, though. And when how many he did, how many he looked pretty bad. play last year? All right, let's get in the vault. And we'll circle back to this. I think we have more discussion. I think, I think the way we circle back to this is that bet on Gino for the year. And we'll just let it play out. I'll put any amount of money, take any qualifier out of it. I'll put any amount of money Casey wants on Geno Smith not being a top five passer next year. Name the price. Well, I mean, we're arguing top 10. You said top five for the bet. Watch the tapes, run it back. <laughs> well, I'm just. Good thing we I'm record the show. Saying, I'm just saying we're arguing about top 10. I, I clearly agree with 10, that. Jake, oh, I'll take top 10. He's not doing top, top five. Top five is. I'll take is top 10. Pretty, it's pretty rough, but I would still maybe even take top five. The dude has. Well, you another, let me know, and I'll weapon. send the check. All right, let's get in the vault. Let's get in the vault. Let's throw something out there. Run it. I already did run it. Run it. Oh, it already ran. <laughs> uh, Jacob, first pick. I mean, how are you not going to take the Reds today? Uh, because they just started. Elliot, your ah. pick. Uh, <laughs> well. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go Cardinals. Cardinals money line. Geno Smith for MVP. Plus Zebra Brazilian Air debuts later tonight. We're 2-0 and on the week. Yeah, you are. You have a huge day today. You can win the week today. Yeah, I could. Big time. Big time that, week. That's you can't huge. Get and by the way, these aren't like minus 3,000. These uh, Yesterday was plus 200. The day before that was plus 160. Listen, guys. I'm starting to get hot. Don't let me get hot. Ride tonight. Z Brazilianaires, we'll see you then. Casey, your pick. Ooh. Uh, I'm going to go with a random home run. I don't know what the lineup is. Anyone? Fraley, 550. 550? Sure. It was in the chat earlier. Mouse Cow's better the day. Yeah. Fraley, 550. Home run. Um, I am going to. I'm just looking through here very quickly. Oh, very. The fast. Reds are down one to zero. Oh. <laughs> are they really? Yeah. Doyle are. home run. Oh no! Hot start. Let's go Giants plus a hundred tonight. Nine forty-five. Let's go. All right, everybody. Thank you for watching today, both off the bench, and uh, thank you for watching Box Lunch. Hope you enjoyed. Tomorrow we will be back. Well, we're also we're getting picky tomorrow. Getting picky tomorrow Let's after, do it. after off the bench. So Let's we'll, do it. We'll do some gambling not talk too and everything. Picky, Paul. But not, well, of course, we're not going to get too picky. But we're going to get a little picky. <laughs> That's tomorrow <laughs> after off the bench. Uh, we're going to have some fun with that, that one. <laughs> and uh, Z Brazilian airs later. Anything else I'm forgetting? July 17th, the Reds game. That'll be fun. Get That'll out there. Fun. Meet the people. S save the date. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.